Rabbi shrahli sadri wa sirli amri wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yafqaw qawli My dear brothers and sisters, my dear friends, Brother Shabir Ali, Brother Sam Noman, and Sam Shamoon. I welcome all of you to today's great event, the debate. Is Quran or the Bible, which is the Word of God? My name is Sabil Ahmed, and on behalf of the Muslim Student Association of the University of Iowa, I welcome all of you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Peace and blessings of Allah be upon all of you. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Brother Shabir Ali. He is the president of the Islamic Information and Dawa Center International, Toronto, Canada. He is host of the weekly radio program in Toronto and also on Ayana Radio Net. And he is the author of many booklets, including common questions people ask about Islam. With that, I would like to invite Brother Samuel Noman to introduce Brother Sam Shamoun. Thank you very much. It's a great honor and privilege for us to be here. I also want to extend my heartfelt thanks <coughs> to Brother Sabil, Brother Shabir, and the Muslim Student Association of this university. Thank you, Brother Abed and, and Saqib and all the gang here. A uh, brief introduction of Brother Sam Shamoun. Brother Sam Shamoun is uh, a Bible teacher. Uh, he is also a resident internet evangelist at the South Asian Friendship Center. He is part of the rebuttal team of the Answering Islam that uh, website that you can go to. Uh, we are honored this evening to have Brother Shabir and Brother Sam uh, and talk, for, talk them about the topic that we have received. One request is this, that uh, this is a very uh, great occasion and I will request you to, if you want to have some conversation, maybe keep it a little bit low. Uh, Brother Sam will go first and he will have 20 minutes to present his topic. Thank you. <clears throat> Praise be the God and Father of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'd like to testify that there is no God but the triune God of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And that Jesus Christ is the resurrected and glorified King of glory and the Lord of all flesh. Amen. I'd like to begin this discussion with the fact that even the debate itself is wrongly titled. The Quran or the Bible, which is the Word of God? Because interestingly, when you read the Quran itself, and when you read the earliest Islamic sources, all the Muslims of latter days presumed that the Bible was the uncorrupt, pure Word of God. And I will seek to prove that point tonight. Interestingly, the criteria that Shabir Ali often uses in his debates against the authenticity of the Gospels as well as the entire Bible can be used against the Quran even more forcefully which I will also demonstrate God willing tonight. Amen. First, I want to appeal to what Shabir Ali considers a reliable source of information. So much so that today he's debating the fact that this source is the Word of God, namely the Quran. To me, the Quran represents the thoughts and ideas of the first Muslims, their views on different areas of life, specifically the Holy Scriptures, the Bible. I will quote the Quran to establish one, that the Bible is the uncorrupt, pure Word of God. And I've heard passages that Shabir Ali often presents in his dialogues, debates and writings to try to give the impression that the Quran denies that the Bible in our possession today is the uncorrupt, pure Word of God. Instead of attacking straw man, I will just quote one passage that he often presents against debaters and in his writings. Chapter 2, verse 79 of the Quran, he quotes this, and this is the portion that he quotes, but he leaves out verse 78. Let me quote the portion that he quotes. Therefore, Woe be unto those who write scripture with their hands and then say, This is from Allah, 
that they may purchase a small gain therewith. Woe unto them for what their hands have written, and woe unto them for what they earn thereby. Now when you quote this passage out of its context, it gives the impression that the Quran is affirming that the Jews and Christians falsified scripture and claimed it was from God. But when you read the verse before it, that interpretation sinks. Now let me read it in context. Chapter 2, verse 78 to 79. Among them are unlettered folk. The Arabic word, and Shabir can correct me, is ummiyun. Who know the scripture not, except from hearsay. They but guess. This is the context of the passage. It is not referring to the Jews and Christians as a whole, corrupting and falsifying revelation. In actuality, it's speaking of unlettered, ignorant amongst the people who did not know the scripture. If they did not know the scripture, how could they corrupt it? So this verse would not support Bible corruption. With that said, let me go into the positive case that the Quran presents that the Bible in my possession, as Muhammad knew it, is the uncorrupt word of God. Basically, what this will do is any time Shabir then decides to attack the Bible, he debunks the testimony of the Quran and therefore can no longer be a Muslim. Let me quote. The first verse is chapter 15, verse 9 of the Quran. It says this, We have without doubt sent down the message, in Arabic, dhikra, and we will assuredly guard it from corruption. Now interestingly, most Muslims feel that this verse is referring to the protection of the Quran. And in its immediate context, it is referring to the Quran. I have no arguments with that. But even more interesting is the fact that the very Quran also calls the Bible the reminder, the message, dhikra. Let me quote those references. Chapter 16, verse 43. And before thee we sent none but men to whom we granted inspiration. If ye realize this not, ask those who possess the reminder, dhikra, the message, referring to to the book and the possession of the Jews and Christians. Chapter 21 verse 7 of the Quran says the same thing. Before thee also the messengers we sent were but men to whom we granted inspiration. If ye know this not, ask of those who possess, present tense, the reminder. Again, chapter 21 verse 48. In the past we granted to Moses and Aaron the criterion, Al-Furqan, for judgment and a light and a reminder, dhikra, for those who would do right. 21 verse 105, before this we wrote in the Psalms, after the reminder, dhikra, my servants the righteous shall inherit the earth. Final reference to the fact that the scripture before the time of Muhammad was called the reminder is chapter 40 verse 53 to 54. We did after time give Moses the guidance and we gave the book an inheritance to the children of Israel a guide and a reminder dhikra to men of understanding. Now the question I pose to Shabir is simply this. If God is consistent and he has sworn that he will protect the reminder and this reminder includes previous scripture how can he even assume the Bible's been corrupt? And if he tells me the Quran says the Bible's been corrupt I ask them to give me one verse that says the text of scripture has been corrupted. Just one saying those words. He will not find it. And if he decides to quote chapter 5 verse 48 or so on and so forth I'm prepared to respond in the rebuttal period. Other passages that show that the Bible is the uncorrupt, pure word of God. Chapter 2, verse 113. The Jews say the Christians are not founded upon anything, and the Christians say the Jews are not founded upon anything, and yet they read the book. Now the question is, what book is the Quran speaking of? It's that same book that the Quran has just testified 
is the reminder sent down by Allah and He would preserve it. Other references showing that the Bible is the uncorrupt pure word of God. Chapter 3 verse 3 of the Quran. He has revealed to you the book with the truth confirming the scriptures which preceded it. For He has already revealed the Torah and the Gospel for the guidance of mankind and the distinction of right and wrong. Now Shabir has an Arabic English dictionary. I ask him to look up the word confirm, sadaqa, and tell us what does it mean. This is the definition of the term. It means to give credence, to believe, to accept as true, confirming, accepting as true, belief, confirming, establishing as true. So the function of the Quran wasn't to expose corruption to the text, it was to confirm its authority as truth from God, preserved by God Almighty. There is no such teaching as Bible corruption. That's a Muslim myth in order to avoid the consequences of affirming that the Bible is the Word of God. Because to do so refutes the Quran. Other verses. Chapter 7, verse 156 to 157. And I will write down my mercy for those who are righteous and give alms and who believe in our signs, who follow the apostle, the unlettered prophet, whom they find written in the Torah and the gospel that is with them. Now according to Shabir's arguments in his research papers as well as debates and lectures, the Torah and the gospel are no longer in its pristine form. What we find today is the words of men. If that's the case, why does Allah say the Torah and the gospel is with you? Why doesn't He say you have it in part but you corrupted the rest? Is Allah deceiving the Christians and the Jews? Please answer that question for me. Chapter 53 verse 36 of the Quran says, Nay, he is not acquainted with what is in the books of Moses. And again, if Muhammad was not familiar with the books of Moses, this presumes that the books of Moses was available in the time of Muhammad. No statement of corruption or embellishment. The Quran doesn't say, well because Moses wrote his obituary in Deuteronomy 34, it can't be the word of God. It doesn't say this. And an all-knowing God should know to provide this information in order to protect from Christians like me using it as the basis to prove that my book is the uncorrupt word of God. Amen. Chapter 5 verse 46 to 47. And we cause Jesus, son of Mary, to follow in their footsteps, confirming, the same Arabic word, that which was revealed before him in the Torah. Let me pause here briefly. We know what the Torah in the time of Jesus was like. We have the Dead Sea Scrolls as well as the Septuagint, irrespective of variant readings. And I will get to the variant readings of the Quran and show that the Quran itself is not a perfectly preserved book according to Islamic sources. So we definitely know what the Torah in the time of Jesus looked like that He confirmed. And it's identical to the Torah that is in my Bible today showing that this is the Word of God. Let me continue. And we bestowed on Him the Gospel wherein, wherein excuse me, is guidance and light confirming that which was revealed before in the Torah a guidance and admonition unto those who ward off evil. And let the people of the gospel judge by what God has revealed in it. Here's my question. If the gospel no longer existed in the time of Muhammad, how could we judge by it? And what was that gospel? Now I've heard arguments say, well, here the Quran says gospel is in the singular. Therefore, it's not speaking of the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Unfortunately, for the Muslims who present this argument, this will not work. Simply for the fact that even Muslim scholars such as al zamakshari and Baidawi admit that the word Injil is not an original Arabic term. It's a loan word from the Syriac. Which means we must go back to the Syriac Christians and see what the gospel was to them. When we look at the history of the church, beginning at the second century, the four full gospel accounts were called the gospel of Christ, not the gospels of Christ. That's why the singular. So if he says it's a singular, that won't do it. Chapter 5, verse 68 of the Quran. 
Say, O people of the book, you are not founded on anything until you perform the Torah and the Gospel and what was revealed to you from your Lord. How could they perform the Torah and the Gospel if it was corrupt? Doesn't make sense. I also hear Muslims say, produce a surah like the Quran. If you believe the Quran is not from God. But what they don't mention is the Quran also challenges unbelievers to not only produce a surah like the Quran, but to produce a book like the Torah and the Quran. Let me read it to you. Chapter 28, verse 48 to 49. But when the truth has come to them from us, they say, Why is he not given the like of what was given to Moses? Did they not disbelieve in that which was given to Moses before? They say two kinds of magic, Torah and the Quran, each helping the other. And they say verily, in both we are disbelievers. Say to them, O Muhammad, then bring a book from Allah which is a better guide than these two, the Torah and the Quran, that I may follow it if you are truthful. Again, why would Allah say, produce a book like the Torah if the Torah was corrupted in the time of Muhammad? Amen. I'd like to hear the response. When we go to the Islamic traditions, what was Muhammad's view of the scriptures available in his time? Let me quote The Life of Muhammad by Ibn Ishaq, page 268. Rafi bin Haritha and Salam bin Mishkam and Malik bin Al Sayyif and Rafi bin Huraymullah. Excuse me, I have a hard time speaking English, let alone Arabic, so I do apologize. Came to him, the Prophet of Islam, and said, Do you not allege that you follow the religion of Abraham and believe in the Torah which we have and testify that it is the truth from God? He replied, Certainly. He doesn't say, Wait, wait, wait. Part of it is from Allah. You have embellished the rest of it. He says, certainly what you have is the Torah from God. So much so that according to Sunan Abu Dawud, when Muhammad went to a madras of the Jews, he asked for the Torah and showed it enough respect that he placed it on a pillow and he says, I believe in thee and in the one who revealed thee. If the Torah was corrupt, how could he bear witness to a corrupt scripture? I'd like the answer for that one. There's more to come in the rebuttal period. Now what about Shabir's methodology against the Bible? That the Bible has variant readings and transcriptional errors and alleged discrepancies. Well, what I'm going to do with the remainder of time, which I only have five minutes by the way. Time really goes fast when you speak uh, very fast. What I'm going to do with the remainder of my time is quote authentic Islamic sources to show that Muslims admit the Quran suffered corruption and is not in its pristine form. No matter what they say, memorization preserved the Quran allegedly. According to these sources, it did not. Let me quote one. This is in Ibn Abi Dawood's book, Kitab. Quote, many of the passages of the Quran that were sent down were known by those who died on the day of Yamama. But they were not known by those who survived them. They were not known. Nor were they written down. They were not written down. Nor had Abu Bakr, Umar, or Uthman by that time collected the Quran, nor were they found with even one person after them. Here is an Islamic source. Whether Shabir considers it reliable or not is a mute point. The fact is, it is a Muslim admitting that passages of the Quran that certain people memorized went with them when they died and no one else knew these verses. I'd like Shabir to comment on that. Another one. Ibn Umar saying, It is reported from Ismail ibn Ibrahim, from Ayyub, from Nafi, from Ibn Umar who said, Let none of you say, I have acquired the whole of the Quran. How does he know what all of it is when much of the Quran has disappeared? Rather, let him say, I've acquire, acquired what has survived. How much time do I have? Two minutes, three minutes? Because I can tell. All right, three minutes, all right. Some surahs that are actually missing from the present text of the Quran. And I have a field day when Muslims bring this up. They'll often ask me, which Bible do you believe in? The Catholic Bible, 73 books, or the Protestant of 66? Well, now I'm going to ask Shabir, which Quran do you believe is the canon of Allah? The 116 of 
Ubay bin Kaab and Ibn Abbas, or the 111 of Abdullah ibn Masood, or the 114 that you have and that you claim is the Word of God. And if you say it's 114, produce one verse in the Quran that says 114 chapters is the canon of Allah. Show that to me, please. Here are the two surahs of Ubay ibn Kaab that are no longer in the text of the Quran. And Ubay ibn Kaab was called the master of the Quranic reciters, one of the top memorizers. And he believed these were part of the book of Allah. Let me quote them, and I guess my time is over. Surat al hafid You alone we worship, and to you alone we pray and lie prostrate, and to you alone we proceed and have descendants. We fear your torture and hope for your mercy. Truly your torture will overtake the infidels. The second one, Surat al khal O oh Allah, you alone we ask for help and forgiveness. We speak appreciatingly of your goodness. Never do we disbelieve you. We repudiate and disbelieve anyone who follows immorality. With that said, I end this part of my discussion and I leave Shabir with the following questions. If you come up and attack the Bible for variant readings, we'll have a field day with the Quran and its thousands of variants. In fact, here's Arthur Jeffrey's book, and the thousand variants of the Quran. If you tell me there are contradictions in the Bible, we'll have a field day with the contradictions in the Quran, with one exception. I will quote the Sunnah and Muhammad's interpretation of the Quran, which forces the contradiction. So you can try to reconcile the passages, that's your private interpretation. You are not the Prophet of Islam, and you must follow the Sunnah being a Sunni Muslim. So we will see what happens from here. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you very much, Brother Sam Shamalm. Now, Brother Shabir will have 20 minutes for his opening <coughs> statement. I begin by praising the Creator of the heavens and the earth and ask him to send peace and blessings upon uh, all of his prophets and in particular upon the last of all of his prophets a man whom he sent with a message for all the world. What I see happening here tonight is a kind of a dichotomy. I see uh, there is uh, a separation between two groups here in the audience uh, so that uh, one group will cheer when one speaker speaks and the other group will cheer when the other speaker speaks. Uh, what I would like to see instead is a kind of more rational academic approach to this discussion where we think about the points being raised and we find out whether or not these points have any validity to them. We look uh, to the reasons that they're being offered for various claims and we uh, think about ways in which we might explore these uh, questions and points a little bit further by doing a little bit of our own research on the side. I do not think that the issue we are discussing tonight will be settled in one night. I think that what we can do, Sam and I, is to stimulate your interest in studying the issue a little bit further. Now, to the issue itself, the Quran or the Bible, which is the Word of God? Muslims claim it is the Quran and Christians claim that it is the Bible. However, Muslims do not claim that the, Quran, that the Bible is not the Word of God. Muslims, in fact, will insist that the Bible does contain revelation from God. And for this reason, Muslims are not surprised to find that there are many passages in the Quran and there are many references from the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace that speak very favorably about the Bible. Now often people will say, well look, this speaks so favorably, that means that the Quran affirms and, and agrees with everything that the Bible says. But one has to see how words are being used, not only in the Quran, but in any other context. A word might have a variety of meanings. When the Quran speaks, for example, about the Torah or the Gospel, Everyone knows that the Torah and the Gospel has changed over time. So when we're referring to the Torah and the Gospel, one has to find out what context is being referred to to find out what exactly is meant by the Torah or the Gospel. Now, I always find it surprising that Christians try to persuade Muslims that the Torah and the Gospel has never been changed. Whereas Christians know themselves that the Torah and the Gospel has been changed. If, for example, you're reading uh, what Sam is accustomed to reading, the New International Version Bible, you will notice in the footnoting of the Bible that it always points out, or often points out, that there's a change here or there. So you will find whole passages sometimes uh, marked off as being a later uh, contribution to the text and not original. 
I see some very uh, <laughs> um, leery eyes here. Uh, look, for example, at Mark chapter 16. Look for verses 9 to 12. You will see that that whole section is marked off as a later addition into the Bible. It's not an original part of Mark's Gospel. Now what happened to the original text of Mark's Gospel? How did it really end? Nobody knows for sure. The interpreter's one-volume commentary on the Bible offers a few suggestions, and among them is the suggestion that what was there was not palatable to the early Christians and somebody deliberately tore it off. And then in its place, other writers wrote some a short ending, some a long ending, and some copied both endings into the one Bible. You'll find that marked off. Don't be surprised if we claim that the Bible has changed over time. In fact, uh, when the Quran uses the term uh, Injil or Torah, one has to see in what context it is uh, referring to the Torah or the Injil. It might be referring to the original Injil sometimes. It might be referring to the Injil which is present in the hands of the readers at certain times. One has to determine what is uh, meant there. When the Quran approves of the Injil and confirms what is in it, the Quran is speaking about the original text revealed from God. At the same time, the Quran goes to great lengths to correct some of the information which is there in the Injil. This is why the Quran said in Surah 5, verse number 48, which uh, Sam would like to explain a little bit further, that uh, not only is the Quran confirming what came before it, but is also a muhaymin on the previous scriptures, which means a controller, a guardian, a watcher, a supervisor, a master over the previous scriptures. So that the Quran not only confirms what is there, but also corrects and shows where it is wrong. Uh, oftentimes, the Quran does not say, look, I'm telling you that the Torah is wrong, or I'm telling you that the Injil is wrong, because the Quran's purpose would not be met by that kind of negative and hostile approach, and I hope that we won't use that kind of hostile approach in our giving the message of Islam. However, when it comes to a debate uh, like this one, sometimes it becomes necessary to make a few points clear. Uh, the Quran gives the correct information without condemning often the previous scriptures. But look at the information. For example, we read in the Quran that God created the heavens and the earth and nothing of weariness touched him. Now that automatically brings to mind Exodus chapter 31 verse 17 from the Bible. What does it say? It says that after God created the heavens and the earth in six days, he rested on the seventh day and he was refreshed. Now Sam will have to explain what is meant by refreshed. But the Quran is telling you now, nothing of weariness even touched God. God is correcting the information. Now in Surah 9, verses number 29 and 30, the Quran replies to those who claim that God has taken a son. Some said uh, that Jesus was the son of God. The Quran says in reply to this, that this is a saying of people who have disbelieved of old. So the Quran right away is making itself clear that wherever in the Gospels or the rest of the New Testament you will find Jesus being proclaimed as the son of God, you must realize that this is not a revelation from God, but it is a saying of uh, those who have disbelieved of old. So the Quran is making itself plain. Not only is it confirming the previous scriptures, but it is also correcting it, supervising it, watching over it, and showing where it went wrong. The Bible tells us that Solomon, who is called Suleiman in the Quran, actually worshipped idols towards the end of his life. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. The Quran tells us on the other hand in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَمَا كَفَرَ سُلَيْمَانُ وَلَكِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينُ كَفَرُوا Suleiman or Solomon did not disbelieve, but it is the devils that disbelieved. The Quran is again making itself plain. Now Christians should be happy to embrace this statement from the Quran, because look, the Bible has writings which you say were written by King Solomon. It, you, you have the Song of Solomon, for example. So now, if Solomon was a disbeliever and if he worshipped idols, then what kind of moral lesson does that give to us? If we're going to read a book which is written by a man who worshipped idols, and the very book is telling us we can't worship idols. So the Quran actually is uh, a book which should be embraced not only by Muslims, but also by Christians. In fact, if one starts from Christianity, understanding the Bible already, and then sees the Quran, one has to be totally impressed with the Quran as a message, as a confirmation from the Almighty God. All of the stories that we are familiar with from the Bible have been cleaned up in the Quran. What do I mean by that? If you look, for example, at the story of the, in the Bible concerning Lot, now there's a lesson there for humankind. Look what the people did and look how God punished them. 
Now that lesson is also there in the Qur'an. But in the Bible, you have a continuation. It says that after Lot was rescued, he went up into the mountain, stayed in a cave with his two daughters, and his daughters instigated each other, and they decided they'll make the father drunk, they'll go lie with him, and have children from him. So one did it the first night, the other did it the second night. Now, you, you must realize that if we're going to give such a thing to our kids to read, we'll have a lot of explaining to do. But rather than go that route, why not give them the pure word of God? The Quran gives you the story of Lot in its pure and pristine form. Now, I said I'm amazed that people try to tell us that the Torah has not been changed. Whereas in fact the Bible itself tells us that the Torah has been changed. In the book of Jeremiah, in chapter 8, verse 8, it says, How can you say we are wise and we have the Torah of the Lord, whereas the lying pens of the scribes have falsified it? So if the pens of the scribes have done that to the Torah, how could anyone tell us that that has not happened to the Torah? Now when we read the books themselves, we wonder which really is the Word of God. We look at the contents of the books and we find out which really is the pure Word of God here. We see often that the Quran is reinstating the message from God but not giving us the kinds of things which we should shun away from. Now you look at the book of Genesis for example. I think if anyone were to just simply read the book of Genesis with an unbiased mind asking yourself, is this really the Word of God? I think you will conclude that parts of it is not the Word of God. And that is the Muslim position. Now, look at the story of Noah. A flood came. The Quran tells us the same thing. A flood came to wipe out the disbelieving people. But now, the Quran tells us about Noah, how he preached to the people, how he appealed to them to worship only the one true God, to give up idol worship. There is a lesson and a moral teaching in the Quran that is wholly absent from the Bible. On the other hand, the Bible tells us in the story of Noah why God decided to send a flood. It tells us in Genesis uh, chapter 1 that God created everything and saw that everything was good. And then God later on found out that people are in error. By the sixth chapter of Genesis, God is fed up with people. It says that it grieved God to his heart. It repented him that he made man. Does God change his mind and become sorry that he made man? But what happened there? In Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 to 4 we read that the sons of God looked down on the daughters of men and found them fear and they came in to the daughters of men and as a result of that were born the giants of old. The Bible book of Genesis chapter 6. Now I'm here to bear witness friends that there is no God but Allah. And I bear witness that Allah never had any grandsons. This story shows that the sons of God came down and had sons from the daughters of men, the giants of old. You see, the Quran actually, without condemning the Bible, is giving you the pure message of God. And all you have to do is to read the Quran and find out. You look at the story of Jesus and whom be peace. Look at the Annunciation. How the angel Gabriel came to Mary and uh, told her that she will be the mother of a child, although she is a virgin. A beautiful story. Told in the Bible, told also in the Quran. Now in the Quran, Mary asks, How can I have a child when no mortal has touched me? And she is told, that is easy for Allah. When He decides a thing, He only says to it, Be, and it becomes. You go to the Bible, and you read essentially the same story, but with a few problems. Because there, when Mary asks the question, she is told by the angel, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So that that which is born within you will be called the Son of God. Now the imagery that gives a person is the imagery of God coming upon Mary the manner in which human beings do it. Now, some of you might be surprised at that, but that is the image that many people have obtained from this passage. In my experience of meeting Christians and debating in a number of different platforms, I have stories I can tell you that will confirm this. 
how some Christians view this. The theologians will say, no, don't think of it that way. But listen to the words of the text and see how different it is than the Quranic wording. And then it says, so that that which is conceived in her will be conceived by the Holy Spirit. Sam himself says that the Holy Spirit conceived Jesus. Amen. Now tell us what that means. And how does that relate to God? Now the Quran gives us the essential message that came to the previous prophets and reinstates that, repeats that for us, and this is what the Quran means when it says it confirms the previous revelations. That is the meaning of the word yasaddiq. It confirms that which came before it. The, the entire Bible, from the beginning to the end, stresses that there is only one God. But there are verses of the Bible which would seem to indicate something else. And many people today read their Bibles uh, like an insurance contract. They don't go for the main message. They don't look at the big picture. They go down into the fine print to make sure there is not something there that they are missing. So what they do is they find one little verse and they say, but look, this looks like it means Trinity. And then they take that. Whereas, that is a problematic teaching in itself. Nobody has been able to explain satisfactorily what exactly is the Trinity. How can God be three and yet one? How can you have three persons, each of whom is completely God, so that's God, that's God, that's God, and together there's still only one God. The Quran rescues us from that by telling us that there is only one God, وَلَا تَكُولُوا ثَلَاثَةً And do not say three. Just say one. Now, as we review the Gospels, we realize that over time, the Gospels were written not in the lifetime of Jesus on whom be peace. Yes, there was only one Gospel. Sam is right about that. But over time, there came to be four Gospels, which are four attempts to record the life and teachings of the man and prophet Jesus the Christ. And over time, as you look at these Gospels, you see that the story about Jesus was evolving. So that in the last of the four Gospels, you have the kinds of claims which Christians are very fond of. For example, that Jesus said, I and the Father are one. That Jesus said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. That Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is in the fourth gospel that you find this. Now that you're saying Amen, think about why it's only in the gospel of John but not in the other three. If Jesus had said these words, Christians... If Jesus had, if Jesus had said these words, you would expect that right from the very start, Christians would have been saying Amen. And every Christian preacher would be preaching the same words. Every gospel writer would be writing the same thing. They're very important words if he said them. But why did Mark not write them? Matthew not write them? Luke not write them? Only John wrote them, the last of the four gospels. That is because the story about Jesus was evolving over time. And his image was going around like a snowball. The more you roll it around, the bigger it gets. So that the image of Jesus appears bigger and greater in the last of the four gospels, the gospel of John. That is not the original original picture, the Quran brings us back to believe in that original picture. He was not the Son of God, but a servant and God's Messiah. The Quran brings us back to the original truth. Now what about this idea that Jesus died for our sins? The Bible says that Jesus died as a ransom for many. The Quran corrects that by telling us that in fact everyone is responsible for his own deeds. If you sin, you repent, you turn back to God, and like the prodigal son, you will be forgiven. That was the original teachings of Jesus before people started teaching that he died for the sins of humankind. Now what does it mean that he died as a ransom for many? If he died as a ransom for us, that means he paid the price with his blood so that we can be released. True? But to whom did he pay the price? To the father, in which case the father appears cruel and unjust for taking the blood of his son. Or did he pay the price to the devil, in which case it looks like the devil is on equal bargaining terms with God and that ain't right either. Nobody can explain these concepts, the Trinity, the Sonship of Jesus, or the ransom sacrifice of Jesus. Come back to the message which the Quran has given us. Now, people tell us that the Bible is the pure word of God. And they say, we should turn away from the Quran, we should go to the Bible. And my 
promise to you is that as you read the Quran, you'll find a world of difference. But it is possible that some people are not familiar with the Bible. I often think that when people like Sam come up here and they preach to us that the Bible is 100% the Word of God, they're not quite familiar with the Bible. I would like to point out to you that in fact, if a book, if a book describes history by gratuitously including sexual imagery, those parts of that book cannot be the Word of God. And I would say that the Bible often does this. And one place in which it does this, and I'd have Sam read that out for you, is in the book of Ezekiel, in chapter 23. So I would ask Sam, as he's asked me a few questions, I would ask Sam, when he comes up here next time, to read for us from Ezekiel, chapter 23, starting with verse number 1, going all the way to verse number 21. And if not that much, then start from verse 11. And if he doesn't have time for that much, start from, just, just read verses 20 and 21. Amen. We'll be okay. And uh, in fact, why don't you read this from this children's Bible? Sure. So that uh, folks can be sure what is there in the children's Bible. Young Explorer's Bible, New International Version, I'll leave that with you. It'll be here when you come back. Just read for us from that. So now, in sum, folks, how much time do I have? One minute. In sum, what I've shown, in fact, is that although the Quran speaks very positively about the Bible, it also tells us where the Bible has gone wrong. But on the whole, the Quran gives us a very positive way of looking at the Bible. The Quran is not here to condemn the Bible, but the Quran is here to introduce light. You do not introduce light by driving away the darkness, but you introduce light by turning on the switch. And this is what the Quran does. The Quran did not come condemning the Christians and the Jews and what they believe in, but introducing the light. And where it became necessary, the Quran made it self-clear. On the other hand, if we want to find out tonight which is the book of God, just read the two and you will find that the Quran is that book of God. On October 31st last year, I'll never forget the date, a young woman, a Canadian woman, came up to me and she decided to embrace Islam. And after I gave her the opening words that brings a person into Islam, I asked her, what made you decide to become a Muslim? And Sarah, this young Canadian woman, said to me, when I read the Quran, Tears flowed down my eyes, and I realized that this is the Word of God. I'd invite you to read the Book of God. Thank you very much, Brother Shabir Ali. Now we will take a 20 minutes break for the Maghrib prayer for the Muslims, and we'll come back exactly at 8.15 for our session inshallah <laughs> Okay, now we will have 10 minutes for Mr. Sam Shamoon for his first rebuttal. Sam Shamoon. First of all, I want to say in the limited time that I have, I want to extend my apologies to any Muslims. If you perceive I'm being offensive, that's not my intention. But in a debate like this, we must wrangle out the points and speak some things that might be difficult for the other parties. With that said, I only have 10 minutes in rebuttal. But I invite you to come to answering-islam.org where all the points that Shabir Ali brought up went on today on the web refuting point by point what he said. Because in 10 minutes, I won't be able to address all. Now he asked me to read Ezekiel 23 verse 20 to 21 if I'm correct. I will read it and then I have a passage in the Quran I will read on behalf of Shabir. And I want to ask him if he'll show this to his daughter. Ezekiel 23 verse 20 to 21. And this is not original with Shabir by the way. Ahmad Didat made this popular. Ezekiel 23 verse 20 to 21. There she lusted after her lavers whose genitals were like those of donkeys 
and whose emissions was like that of horses. So you longed for the lewdness of your youth when in Egypt your bosom was caressed and your young breast fondled. Now Shabir wants to throw this out for a shock effect. Basically he thinks that Christians who read this passage will be shooken up. If that's the case, then he's going to have to toss out the Quran because according to Allah in paradise, he'll have 70 huris and this is the description. Surely for the God-fearing awaits a place of security, gardens and vineyards and maidens with swelling breasts, like of age and a cup overflowing. Would you read this to your daughter? Secondly, he mentions about the Holy Spirit overshadowing Jesus Christ. And then he went into the deity of Christ. The debate is not Jesus divinity or not. It's the Quran or the Bible. So your red herrings will not work tonight. We can address that on another night and I will challenge you to the debate. Is Jesus God and is Muhammad a prophet? Let's debate those points. Let's not throw out red herrings. And the Apostle Paul addresses Shabir when he says, To the pure all things are pure, but to the corrupt and unbelieving nothing is pure because their very minds and consciences are corrupt. For someone to read the gospel and come out with perverted thoughts, that's a problem with his mind, not the scripture that's inspired by a holy God. Amen. Now let me go back on the variants of Mark. If we're going to talk about variants, Brother Shabir, we will have a field day with the Quran and its thousands of variants. In fact, go on the Answering Islam website and you'll find a book called The Perfect Quran or was it so made to appear unto them. The author documents from microfiche the thousands of variants that exist between the manuscript of the Quran in Tashkent with the printed Quranic text today. I quoted to him Ibn Umar who said, you do not have all of the Quran intact. The fact of the matter folks is no document of antiquity has come down variant free without corruption. But the Bible is superior in that it has thousands of manuscripts where we can see where these variants took place. But what about the Quran? The few manuscripts you have have thousands of variants and instead of burning Bibles, Christians died to preserve them whereas Uthman burned Quranic codices. So it was a God-believing Muslim who burned the word of Allah. Whereas it was God-fearing Christians who were dying for the book of God. Then he quotes to me chapter 5 verse 48, Muhaymin alay. And I expected Shabir to have read my materials and rebuttals to this. He talks about words having different meanings in different contexts. One of the names of Allah is Muhaymin. Does that mean Allah exposes corruption and preserves intact what remains pure? Muhaymin means different things in different contexts. And in the consensus of Muslim translators today and in the past, they understood the term to mean confirming and safeguarding the Bible. In fact, I have an appendix and citation from Al-Baidawi. And Baidawi commentating on the verse says that Muhaymin means that the Quran safeguards, does not expose corruption to the biblical text. He still has not refuted the fact that in the Quran, the Bible is called dhikr, reminder, that which Allah swore to preserve. He hasn't addressed that. Hopefully in your 10 minutes you will. So I can come back and rebut you. Then he mentions the fact that a Canadian comes up to him and converted to Islam. I have a young lady here who asked personally to be mentioned by name, who was a Muslim, who now worships Jesus as her Lord and Savior. And there she goes. What does this prove? This proves absolutely nothing. All it proves is try to shock the audience into being shaken by your comments, which prove nothing at all. Then he talks about other aspects of the Bible that he would not show to his daughter. Would you show the verse in the Quran where it says that women can be beat by their husbands in Islam? And I have the commentators and the hadith of your prophet where one woman who was beaten and had a green mark came to Muhammad. And instead of saying, let your husband come back and we will rebuke him for that act, he goes, well Allah has condoned that, so be it. What do you do with that? If you're going to talk about these points, let's debate these points Topic by topic, subject by subject, let's not throw out red herrings. Especially, I only have 10 minutes to rebut everything you've thrown out. What is my time, by the way? Five, Five minutes, all right. He mentions Jeremiah 8.8. 8. And interestingly, I've already responded to this. Jeremiah is not saying that the scribes corrupted the text. How do we know? 
Because in the very book of Jeremiah, he appeals to the Torah and commands the Jews to follow it. How could he if he believed it was corrupt? Daniel chapter 9, quoting Jeremiah, proceeds to quote the Law of Moses, knowing full well of Jeremiah 8.8, 8, and he never made the connection that Jeremiah 8.8 8 was teaching corruption to the text. That's your interpretation imposed on the text. Thirdly, the Lord Jesus Himself, as the Quran testifies, confirmed the Torah in His possession. And it does not mean that He exposed corruption to it and affirmed what remained intact. That's again your interpretation. One that's not consistent with the Hadith that I quoted. One that's not consistent with the fact that the Quran tells Muhammad, if you are in doubt, ask those who had the revelation before you in Surah 1094. Now I've heard Badawi's interpretation. It's not speaking of Muhammad, it's speaking of unbelievers to verify that God does speak to men and not just send angels. Irrespective, the very fact that Allah would tell people, go to the people of the book, means that He believed the book was uncorrupt. And if you came to me, I tell you, discard the Quran and believe in the Bible and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So do as Surah 1094 tells you, don't correct my scripture, come and I will inform you according to your own revelation. That's what the Quran teaches. So far you have addressed none of the points. Hopefully in your 10 minutes you can do so. And then he talks about God repenting. One of the names of Allah is Tawab. Who at the Tawab? He repents. Does that mean Allah changes his mind? Using your logic, we would agree that Allah also changes his mind because he responds accordingly to the actions of his creatures when they repent or if they persist in sin and he brings judgment upon them. He talks about God being refreshed. If you read the scripture in its context, Brother Shabir Ali, you would realize that the Bible uses many human ascriptions to describe the incomprehensible nature of God on our finite level. Much like the Quran talking about God repenting, much like the Quran saying that Allah has eyes and hands, and that, so on and so forth. Now we would agree with you that Allah also repents and He has a physical body, much like you're trying to argue against the Bible. So far those are all the points that I was able to muster up. You went very fast for me in 20 minutes, but that's okay. We'll have another occasion to address these points. How much time do I have, brother? One minute. I'll give him that minute to address the points. Thank you very much, Shabir. The brother Shabir has 10 minutes for his rebuttal, inshallah. Now, let me get my watch. Hold on a sec. You got 11 minutes. <laughs> I'll give you <laughs> I won't need it. I don't think so. Now, uh, Sam starts by reading the verse, and then he compares that with the verse from the Quran. But I wonder how many people really think that these two verses are comparable. What he said was there is a verse in the Quran which speaks of women have swelling breasts. And that's comparable with the verse which he read which said that a certain woman lusted after men who had members the size of that and whose emission was the extent of that like horses and donkeys. And that is similar to saying that a woman has swelling breasts. Moreover, the passage which she reads from the Quran doesn't actually mean that. The verse which uh, is looking at is from uh, Surah Ammiyat Sa'alun, which says, Inna lil muttaqina mafaza, hada'ika wa a'naba, wa kawa'iba turaba, wa ka'san dihaka. You ask me, would I teach that to my daughter? She has memorized it. All of my kids have memorized it. In fact, I will take you to the school where my kids have attended and I'll show you that kids this high have memorized it and they're studying that and they're understanding it. Kawaib actually refers to attractive women and that is promised to men in paradise. Yes, we're not ashamed to say that the Quran has promised men to have women in paradise and that helps us to avoid having women here outside of marriage because we know we're going to have it there. But those who think they're not going to have it there are often having it right here. <laughs> Now I want to ask you, has your daughter memorized the verse which you have read here? And I want to know how many people have memorized the verse which was read here from the Bible. 
On the other hand, how many people have memorized the verse which was read from the Quran? In the little Muttaqin Mafazah. There you go. How many people would teach that to their kids? Yes, we teach that to our kids. In fact, many young kids all over the world have memorized the entire Quran. We recite the Quran without shame. Now, the divinity of Jesus, is that a red herring? No. We're looking at the contents and teachings of the scriptures. And if we see that the scripture teaches something which is plainly wrong, we have a right to say that as far as we're dealing with this topic, the scripture is wrong. That wrong part cannot be the word of God. Look, if any man comes and tells me that he has one bucket of water, and another bucket of water, and a third bucket of water, and together the three are just one bucket of water like the first one, I would say this is not right. So if you bring me a book and you show, look, it's in that book, I would say the book is not right. And that is the very point. So if you say Jesus is divine, that means he is God. But if he is God, how is he also man? Christians say that he's completely God and completely man at the same time. I promise you he can't be both. In the book Common Sense Christianity we read that to say that Jesus was completely God and completely man at the same time is as nonsensical as saying I saw a square circle. Such a thing cannot exist. Now his challenge to me is to debate him on the topic, is Jesus God uh, or, uh, and is Muhammad a prophet? Now would I accept that challenge? Well for me to have a debate folks, I want to have a kind of academic discussion. I don't want a kind of discussion where somebody say, yeah, amen, and somebody say, yeah, Allahu Akbar. I want people to think about the issues. And I want to, to have a debate where Sam will come here and he will recognize the difference between you know, something like that of horses and something like that of donkeys and between a woman having swelling breasts. So if Sam can come up and recognize that difference, yes, I'm willing to, to have a debate with, with Sam on a number of different topics in the future uh, after mutual agreement. Now he mentioned that Uthman burned the Quran and he said that Christians were trying to preserve the Bible. But notice, after all the Christian attempts, the Bible is still being corrected and edited. Now you might tell me that uh, the one by Barbara Allen is the Greek text which you rely upon because that's the text that stands behind the New International Version Bible. It is now in its 27th edition. Do you know that? It keeps uh, changing. Whereas the Quran on the other hand has been preserved by Muslims right from the very start. Now why did Uthman burn the Quran? Because right from the very start people were trying to preserve the Quran but the best of human effort sometimes fails. People may not uh, know the full extent of the Quran. People may make mistakes as they copy. And I see some of you laughing as though you don't know textual history of the Bible. Uh, right in front of Sam there is a book entitled The Text of the New Testament, Its Transmission, Corruption and Restoration by Bruce Metzger. Giving you all the textual history of how errors occur when people try to write things. So what Uthman did was he made sure that the one text which was agreed upon by the companions of the Prophet, the people who lived and walked with him and heard from him directly and knew the contents of the Quran, once that was prepared and approved upon, he ordered that the others should be burned. Because they may contain mistakes, they may contain variant readings, and rather than confuse the public, give them the one pure word of God and promote that one. Now what's wrong with that? If Christians had a text which is approved by the disciples of Jesus, they would defend that with their very lives and I wouldn't blame them. But we do not have such a text, folks. Now, Muslims rightly defend the Quran as the word of God after Uthman had burnt the rest. He burnt the rest not to destroy the word of God, but to preserve the word of God. And we have that preserved word of God today. I can hold up this book and say the Arabic text here is the word of God 100%. I would like Sam to come up and hold up a book and tell me that is the word of God 100%. I bet you he couldn't do it. If he's honest. Now he said, how is the Qur'an Muhaymin? And I think he is. How is the Qur'an Muhaymin on the previous scriptures? He says, well that means correcting and also approving. And then he says, well look, Allah is Muhaymin also. So does that mean that Allah is approving the truth and correcting the wrong? Yes! <laughs> Then tell us what you said and I'll answer that. Now he spoke about the conversion of a certain person. Notice that the person that I mentioned that converted, actually converted after reading. And that is the Quranic message. Read, learn, think. But if you mention somebody that just simply converted, that doesn't really help anything, does it? People might convert for a number of reasons to a number of different things. But are we converting to what makes sense? Or something that doesn't make sense? 
that has to be addressed. Now he says a woman can be beaten according to the glorious Quran. Now do you want to get into a long discussion as to what is the position of women in the Quran and the Bible? I mean we can do that. Yes? yes? yes. Well, alright. Uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verses 4 and 5, shows that women will not enter paradise. <laughs> Now, you know, the Muslims are clapping, the Christians are laughing, uh, the Muslims believe and the Christians don't believe, but look, both of you, whether Muslim or Christian, don't believe me, go and read the text. It says 144,000 people will go to heaven, only these, and they will be virgins who have not been defiled by women. Now maybe Sam has an answer for that. Look, if you want to compare the position of the women in the Quran and the position of women in the Bible, you will find such a vast difference. I told you before, people do not know the contents of their Bibles. And they come here and tell us that the Bible is 100% the Word of God. You might say 99.9% .9 because look, you've already rejected this verse. You won't believe it. You know it's wrong and that proves that the Bible is not 100% the Word of God. Now he mentioned the hadith, but he should mention the source of that hadith. And this is often a problem in this kind of debates, that people mention things which are not from authentic sources. We don't just believe anything that anybody said, but it must come from an authentic source. What about Jeremiah chapter 8 verse 8? Is that my interpretation of it? No. In the Living Bible, or the, rather the Bible in Living English, in the preface it says that Jeremiah here in chapter 8 verse 8 is speaking about the fact that the text of the Torah in his day was so corrupt, so corrupt that he can say that falsehood had been deliberately put into it. And he said that it would be, it would be hard for us to prove that the text we have today is not the same one that Jeremiah was condemning. So it's not my interpretation. Jesus confirmed the Torah. How do you know that? Because you read it in the Gospels. How do you know the Gospels are true? Because the Bible is true. But that's the very point we're debating tonight and we're showing that in fact the Bible is not 100% true. Now, he says, well, we should ask those who receive the book and they will tell us the truth. But no, the Quran says, Fas'alu Ahl al-Dhikr. It doesn't say believe the Ahl al-Dhikr. It tells you just question them. So when we question them, we find out what we're saying and we also see where they're right and where they are wrong. Now, he says that Allah is tawab and that means he's repenting. No, it means forgiving. Just check the dictionary. I have here the hands where modern dictionary. Notice also that the Quran, in addition to saying that Allah is tawab, doesn't say that he changed his mind or that it made him sorry or he grieved in his heart because he had made man. The Bible says that the Quran doesn't so you have to understand the difference between the two statements. Make uh, mention of that and then we'll look at more debates. Refreshed? What do you mean that God refreshed? You have to explain. Alright, God has eyes so he sees. But what do you mean that he refreshed? Was he tired out over the weekend and then by Monday morning he's fresh for work? God is not like that. Once you realize that God is not like that, you realize that there is an error in the Bible and you need to come back to the Quran, the Word of God. Okay, thank you very much, Brother Shabirali. Now, Brother Sam will have five minutes for his rebuttal. It's kind of disappointing to hear the kind of information being passed. He says that the hadith I quoted is weak. No. Go to answering-islam.org and go see it for yourself. I challenge you. Secondly, he talks about Revelation 14 and he's quoting a Jehovah Witness argument. It's like me quoting Nation of Islam against him. That doesn't work. Read the context. It's speaking of 144,000 of Israel who were specifically chosen for a task. But if you go back to the first reference in Revelation 7, after mentioning the 144,000, this is what you conveniently forgot. Revelation 7 verse 9 all the way to 10. After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Amen. That's the context. Do not misquote my scripture. Secondly, he talks about kawab and what it means. I didn't give this interpretation. One of your premier Muslim commentators, Ibn Kathir, said that kawab means swelling breasts. 
And then you're trying to say, well, it's a distinction and a different meaning from Ezekiel. You're exactly right. Whereas Ezekiel, it's metaphorical and spiritual, talking about Judah and Samaria's apostasy and idolatry. Here, Allah speaking, literally, you're going to have sex abates in paradise. Something you need to deal with. And then again, he quotes to me a Bible from some scholars, and he thinks this is binding on me, on Jeremiah 8.8. It's the same as if I quote Rashid Khalifa, his translation of the Quran, a Muslim, who says that Surah chapter 9, verse 128 and 129 was added. That's your Muslim. I, that's not me. What we must do is examine the light of these statements in light of their presuppositions. The people that he's quoting most often are anti-supernaturalists. In fact, I've documented in my response to his website that the very criteria they use against the Bible, I've had a field day against the Quran to show it's not the Word of God. Go to answering-islam.org and see it for yourself. All the latest rebuttals against Shabir Ali are online. And I challenge him, respond. And we'll respond back. And if you want to debate the deity of Christ, let's debate it, not in 10 minutes, throw out a red herring about why three cannot be one. And you also misinform the audience about what we believe about God. We don't believe in three pales. We believe in one being eternally existent in three persons. Whether you understand it, that's your problem, not ours. It's revelation. We accept it. Because God is a triune being. And let's debate the issue. And let's be honest. And let's be fair. Let's debate is Muhammad a prophet? Which I've challenged you before. And now, publicly, let's take the challenge. And let's hold it in an academic setting. With more time in the rebuttals. Not 10 minutes, 5 minutes. So you can throw out your points and end up last. And give the impression that you've won the debate. <laughs> that doesn't work. I invite every one of you. Go back to answering-islam.org. And read the context of the passages, read the articles, go do your homework. And I agree with Shabir. Here it's not about winning or losing a debate. It's about stimulating you to go search the truth and you'll see where the truth lies. And I have no doubt you'll worship Jesus as your Lord and Savior when you do that. That's awesome. No brother, Shabir will have his five minutes of rebuttal, inshallah. Now, as the debate uh, narrows down to a close, we come to see what are the main threads of argument in this debate. We've seen that uh, Sam started out by saying that the Quran actually approves of the Bible, and therefore Muslims should not criticize the Bible, Muslims should not say that anything is wrong with the Bible. What we have shown instead is in fact, although the Quran confirms the truth which is there in the Bible, the Quran also clarifies some issues that leaves doubt uh, from the Bible and uh, the Quran in fact uh, corrects some of the misinformation that is there in the Bible. For example, when the Bible talks about Solomon uh, disbelieving and we realize that Solomon was not a disbeliever, the Quran is correcting that. Whereas in fact uh, the Bible goes out of its way to describe uh, sexual content like Lot and his two daughters, the Quran gives us just the bare truth about Lot and does not include all of this, uh, you know everybody likes a little bit of uh, sex and blood and gore in the story. Uh, the Quran does not go into that sort of thing. Now. The Quran then both confirms and corrects the Bible. Today, if somebody wants to find out what really is the Word of God, you just read the two texts together and see that the moral teaching which is there in the Bible is also there in the Quran. So that the Quran does not lose anything uh, from the truth which is there in the Bible. On the other hand, whereas the Bible has accretions, the word of man that has crept into it over time, the Quran actually leaves that out and gives us just simply the pure word of God. Now, if we go to some of the minor points then, uh, Sam is saying, well go to the Answering Islam website, you'll see the information on the Hadith. Is Answering Islam website uh, a source of information about Hadith? Is that where scholars of Hadith turn for information? No, in fact, when we have a debate here, it, it is, I think, pointless to say, well, I have the information somewhere else. No, folks, when you come to a case, you have to bring your evidence and present it here. This is why we have equal time. But it is a diversion from the equality of the time to say, well, I have it in a book somewhere, or my father knows that, or, you know, my friend told me that. Bring the evidence here. 144,000. Is that my misunderstanding of the text? 
It is possible that the writer of the Revelation did mean to exalt celibacy and virginity. The likelihood is that he was writing about AD 90, when this tendency was already in the church. If that is so, we will have to lay this passage on one side, because tested by the rest of the New Testament, it is not a correct statement of Christian ethic. This author is saying we, got to, we have to put that passage aside. It's not correct for Christians. A Muslim? No. Daily Study Bible Series. William Barclay, Book of Revelation. Now, you might shake your heads. William Barclay is a man of accomplishment. And I often have Christians tell me, well, you know, uh, William Barclay. And then I tell them what William Barclay says and they say, no, 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 not William Barclay. <laughs> will there be sex in paradise? Yes. Now I ask the Christians, what will you do in paradise? Play the harp and sing hymns? <laughs> In fact, when Jesus spoke about the kingdom of God, he spoke about a kingdom which in some ways resemble our present kingdom. And if you think the sons of God in heaven do not have sex, then what were they doing in Genesis chapter 6, mating with the daughters of, of men and producing the giants of old? No, there will be sex in paradise. There will be food in paradise. We'll have this in a different existence. It will not be the same existence here where there is a foul smell and where there are negative effects that come from it. The pleasure will remain, but not the pain. Now what about uh, Kawaib? It doesn't matter if a Muslim said that. It is true that Kawaib refers to women who have come to that age where their breasts have swollen as opposed to young girls who do not have that. It is a word in Arabic depicting this level of age of growth, of puberty, of teenagerhood. And that is what is promised for men in paradise. That is the word. It says that the men will have kawaii. They will have this kind of woman, which means attractive women. What's wrong with saying that men will have attractive women? On the other hand, Ezekiel says that this woman had uh, sex with these men whose members were like that. Why do you have to find out what the members were like? Which author was finding out what the members of the men were like and the emissions were like and writing that in the book of God? You tell me that this is the book of God? No, I don't think so, folks. And he said, I produced that for shock effect. But indeed, the Christians are shocked. They don't realize that something like that is there in their Bibles. And they have to now, except for a few who are shouting hallelujah in the front. <laughs> now, I have to leave it then and come back to you in the next two, uh, segment when we'll conclude this important debate. Thank you very much. Yeah, before we start the next uh, session, which is uh, rebuttal by uh, Sam Shamoon, 2.5 minutes, I would like uh, the volunteers to pass out the index cards so we could fill out the questions. And uh, after Sam's and the Brother Shabir Ali's uh, rebuttals, I will announce uh, the written answers, inshallah. And when you do write the written answers, be specific, just write one question and write down who do you want to answer the question. Raise your hand if you want. Yeah, do raise your hand so the volunteers could come and pass the cards to you. Okay. Uh, can you also uh, make a time to turn the back of the things and just go through that and tell them? Okay, as the cards... No long statements and you cannot contradict this question from the floor. Okay, the, the questions have to be written on the index cards, not pre-made questions, please. Okay, as the cards have been passed out, there are a few announcements I would like to make. Brother Shabir Ali, he would be giving a lecture on 15th of April, which is this Saturday, on the topic, the Bible, the Quran, and science. It is in the Illinois room, IMU, at 3 p.m. inshallah. And there is a book exhibition by the MSA of this campus. This would be in the Iowa and Penn State room from 1 to 5 p.m. And there is uh, information on Islam on the public access channel number 2 from Tuesday and Saturday. Tuesday from 3 to 4 and Saturday from 1 to 2 p.m. Okay, now we will have Sam Shamoon with his 2.5 minutes of rebuttal. First of all, let me explain why we have a problem with sex in paradise, because our Lord Jesus debunks it. In Luke chapter 20, verse 34, all the way down 
to verse 36, he says, Jesus replied, The people of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of taking part in that age and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They can no longer die, for they are like the angels. That's why we have a problem with that. And if you have 70 huris for the males, what about the women? How many men will they have? Does Islam answer that? Thirdly, when he mentions the fact that in Genesis chapter 6, the sons of God slept with women, because they left their natural habitat and assumed human form. Read the context, please. He quotes William Barclay as if William Barclay is a prophet and infallible. That's a fallacy of appeal to authority, Shabir. Give us proof within context for William Barclay's assertion. He has none. So that's a fallacy in argumentation. By the way, Robert Morey gives you his compliments on that. Going back to the subject at hand. The reason why I'm entered answering Islam is not because I don't have the information. It's with me. But when you're going back 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, you cannot compile all the information at the moment. That's why I invited you to go to Answering Islam. And then he attacks Answering Islam because he says they're not a Hadith expert. Well, neither is he a Bible expert, but he has a whole website trying to explain the Bible to Christians. How does that work? Anyway, let me leave you with this thought. My intention was not to come and offend the Muslim minds. I was here to share what I believe to be true, and I used the sources that Shabir Ali believes to be the Word of God to affirm that my book is the uncorrupt, pure Word of God, which he still has not answered, chapter 15, verse 9. He hasn't answered the rest of the passages which speak of an uncorrupt, pure book available in the time of Muhammad, which he appealed to. And don't forget Ibn Ishaq. When the Jews came to Muhammad, they say, Do you believe in this Torah we have? Certainly. That means you're not following the Sunnah of your Prophet. If not, tell us why not. May the Lord Jesus richly bless you. And I pray that the God who exists, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, will convict your hearts to go back and read the truth. Because Christ is risen, the tomb is empty, and He is Lord. And I challenge Shabir, let's debate on that another night. Amen. Okay, the volunteers uh, could start collecting the cards and the people who do still want to write the questions, they could uh, raise their hands still. Now Brother Shabir Ali will have his concluding 2.5 minutes. I regret that as we come to the close of this debate, the attitude with which uh, we started out has not really changed. And uh, I hope that it will change for the future, that we can think about the points being made. It's easy to uh, say Amen, and it's easy to say Allahu Akbar when your team seems to be winning. But uh, let not teams win, let truth prevail. Think about the ideas which are being discussed, and uh, think about how you might try to find out for the future uh, whether these ideas are true or not, what other evidence you might need, where further can you research these items. So think about the issues for yourself. More importantly, think about the evidence that is being produced uh, for the positions taken here tonight. For example, uh, Sam spoke about sex in paradise. He says Jesus debunks it. But let's ask now, how do we know that Jesus debunks it? Because the Gospels say so. But how do we know the Gospel is true? Because the Bible is true. But how do you know the Bible is true? That's the very thing we're debating here tonight. And to assume it is true while we're debating it is to commit the fallacy known as begging the question. Now, he said that uh, people would be like angels. But then he agreed that the angels came down into the form of man and had sex with women. But if he's saying that that happens with angels and we are going to be like angels in heaven, what's to stop us from having sex in heaven? I mean, somehow the logic doesn't follow. Now, he says William Barclay has no proof. Have you read William Barclay? No, you haven't. How do you know he has no proof? I, I don't understand. I don't understand how you know that William Barclay has no proof if you have not read William Barclay. Now, what would women have in, in paradise? 
They will have whatever they desire. That is the Quranic promise to them. Now, whose website should we check? He says, well, Jibreel's got a website. But notice, I didn't say, go check my website for the evidence. I do not quote that way. I quote respected authorities from Christian sources. What about Surah 15, verse 9? What about the Hadith from Prophet? I already answered that. The Quran speaks positively. The Prophet speaks positively about the Bible, where the Bible has true information. But also negatively, where the Bible has incorrect information. He said it himself. Allah is Muhammad. He approves what is right and he corrects what is wrong. Okay, thank you very much, Brother Shabir Ali and Brother Sam Shamoun. Now what we'll have a short break while while me and the Brother uh, Samuel Naman we will uh, check the questions. Uh, and we will have alternate uh, questions to each speaker, inshallah. Okay, thank you very much, Brother Shabir Ali and Brother Sam Shamoun. Now what, we'll have a short break while, while me and uh, Brother uh, Samuel Naman, we will uh, check the questions uh, and we will have alternate uh, questions to each speaker, inshallah. The first question would be addressed to Brother Shabir Ali. He will have three minutes to respond to the question. And two minutes will be taken by Sam Shamoon as a rebuttal to the answer of Brother Shabir Ali. And vice versa I will alternate each question. And the first question to Brother Shabir Ali is, can the Quran be verified objectively? If so, how? The Bible could be confirmed in the year 2000. God suspends the earth over nothing. Job 26, 7. Egypt will never again exalt itself. Ezekiel 29, 15. Now, uh, am I being heard? Yeah. 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 Alright, the... The question is to, to try and see how we can find verification for either the Quran uh, or the Bible. And here we have some verification for the Bible, that the Bible contains some truth. Here is a true statement. Indeed we have confirmation for the Quran as well. The Quran has been shown in modern times to be very scientifically accurate to the amazement of modern scientists. For example, Dr. Keith Moore, University of Toronto professor, uh, has found that in his subject of embryology, there are statements in the Quran that uh, amaze him because he realizes that certain things which were discovered only in modern times are already stated in the Quran as though this information were known, but it was not known prior to the uh, discovery of the microscope. And he th thinks that this is an evidence that the Quran is a revelation from the Almighty God. Uh, uh, supporting him on this uh, kind of conclusion is, for example, Dr. T. V. N. Persaud from the University of Winnipeg, and Dr. Jolie Simpson, Dr. Uh, Marshall Johnson, and several uh, professors and scholars of embryology worldwide. Uh, for example, Dr. Tejata Tejasin at the University of Chiang Mai in Thailand, attending a Saudi conference in which they were discussing this, finally stood up and said, it is time to say La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. The information overwhelmed him so much that he decided to embrace Islam. He found that this information could not have come from a human mind. Moreover, the Quran itself, as we examine it, we realize that it came uh, through an unlettered man. He could not have been the author of this book. Moreover, this man suffered. He must have been sincere, so that uh, a non-Muslim writer like William Montgomery Watt concludes that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was sincere. He wasn't lying to the people saying that a book came to him. And uh, when we look at his psychology, we realize that the book couldn't have come from him because the book speaks to him, addresses him, and on occasion even criticizes him. We see that what the book says about the past in history 
is confirmed so that the book is true. What the book says about the future is also confirmed. For example, the Quran describing a certain battle which had nothing to do with the Prophet Muhammad himself, peace be upon him, between the Romans and the Persians actually gave correct information concerning that. The future unfolded exactly the way that the Quran said that it would. Who could have predicted something like that? Even the non-believers were amazed that such a prediction can be made and then the prediction was fulfilled. Uh, moreover, the Quran challenges people to find errors in the book and nobody has been able to come up with something which is a genuine error in the Quran. The Quran even challenged people to come up with a book like it to prove that it can be done and nobody is able to come up with something like the Quran to prove that it is humanly possible to produce such a book. I think all of these arguments going together plus what we have presented here tonight showing that compared with the Bible, the Quran is a restatement of the original truth that came through all of God's prophets over time. All of these uh, form a strong cumulative argument to show that the Quran really is what it claims to be, the Word of God and nothing else. In those brief three minutes, Shabir threw out about 50 points for me to address. Let me try to cover each specific point. First of all, scientific accuracy is not an indication of inspiration because the devil himself is an immaterial being and can see what happens in a mother's womb. That's first. Secondly, many have taken exception to the statements made by Keith Moore and have documented from early writings that there was schools throughout Arabia teaching Galanic medicine. And if you compare what Galen says to what the Quran says, it's virtually identical, so there was nothing new in the Quran. What's new is the misinterpretation of Quranic words to force it to agree with modern scientific data. And if you want more information, as Shabir was telling me, don't talk about my father or my mother having it, go to Answering Islam. They have it. That's it. Yeah. It's a question for Sam. Sam, should we rely on the human reasoning to determine this divine word of God? Should we rely on human reasoning to determine the divine word of God? You have three minutes. All right. Different Christians have different responses because we have to arrive at truth somehow and in order to test the claims of the Bible and the Quran we have to have some methods of testing. But unfortunately when we do so we impose a fallible human method on God's infallible truth. So this becomes very difficult. So I agree that in order to arrive at certain truths that humans can take and reassure their hearts that either the Bible or the Quran is true we need some type of testing. But those testing and those methods are not binding on either the Bible or the Quran because the Bible and the Quran, if either one of them is the truth of God, cannot be proven or disproven by human efforts because God exists apart from human arguments. He doesn't depend on our arguments to prove His existence or His word. And so I am divided over this issue. That's my I think that uh, the existence of God cannot be absolutely proved. And uh, it follows, I think, from that, that the, the, the question of whether a book really is the Word of God cannot be absolutely proved. However, I think that we can marshal good arguments, uh, good reasonable arguments to show that God does exist. And we can say that on balance, it is more reasonable to believe that God does exist than that He does not exist. Uh, furthermore, I think that we can marshal good arguments for uh, a book being the Word of God, and we can conclude that it is more reasonable to believe that that book is the Word of God, rather than to believe that it is not the Word of God. And I've given some very good reasons for the Quran in this particular way. I think also that it is possible to disprove a book as the Word of God. In other words, there can be some objective criterion whereby if we start by knowing what God is and we say God is like this, we can say, well, this cannot be His Word. So when Muslims and Christians come together and we say that God is not the author of confusion and we agree on that, then if there is confusion and contradiction in a text, we should say that this text is not the Word of God and that we can conclude. If we say, for example, that God would not uh, describe things with a gratuitous mention of sexual imagery, and we find that in the book, then we can say this is not the Word of God, at least in that part. So while we might not have a way of absolutely proving that a text is the Word of God, if we start with certain assumptions about who God is, we can determine that a certain text is not His Word. Okay, another question for Brother Shabir Ali, three minutes. How was the Quran originally recorded? 
First, I should say that the Quran has been preserved right from the very beginning uh, to this day by two methods. One is uh, through written records, and two is by memorization. I already mentioned that my daughter has memorized a certain passage from the Quran, and that young kids have memorized the entire Quran. This is a tradition that goes on uh, today and dates back to 1400 years ago. The Quran has a unique uh, history in the uh, context of world religious scriptures because right from the very start it was recognized to be the word of God by its followers. Whether they were mistaken or not is a different question, but they believe this from the start that it is coming from Muhammad as a conduit bringing the revelation from God. And because they believed it to be the Word of God, they took the greatest pains to make sure that this book would be preserved both in writing and in memory. But in the early days, memory was the most important manner in which the text was preserved. The Arabic text is a consonantal text. And if we rely on the writing alone, one may not know how to pronounce the text. And this has given rise to many variations in reading over time. Some of the variations which uh, uh, Sam tried to point out to me when he gave me the book of Arbery. I've already read Arbery and I've seen that that he points out minor variations, like instead of saying Maliki al Medin, someone says Maliki al Medin. One means owner of the day of judgment, the other one means ki king of the day of judgment. And to Muslims, uh, one does not make any difference than the other. Both to Muslims are acceptable readings. But Muslims memorize the text, and by memorizing, they preserve the text in such a way that even if some people died out, or even if some books were burnt or destroyed, the text would remain. Earlier, Sam mentioned that uh, with the uh, dying off of people in the Battle of Yamama, uh, some parts of the text was lost forever. But this is impossible to contemplate because right from the very start, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was preaching the Quran out publicly. He was reciting it from the pulpit. He was reciting it in the public prayer, just as we have done here tonight. And the masses of the Muslims were hearing that and they knew the content of the Quran. It is impossible to claim that uh, some people died and the Quran died with them. Uh, it is more reasonable to assume that whoever made this claim is mistaken himself. And this is what, uh, in fact, the father of that man himself had claimed uh, who made these claims. Ibn Abu Dawud said that the Quran was lost and his father said, my son is lying. In response to that, very simply, if memorization preserved the Quran, then why was it that memorizers writing from memory wrote conflicting Qurans with some having additional verses that the others did not? So memorization did not preserve the Quran. He also mentioned earlier that Uthman standardized the Quranic texts and I believe he alluded to the fact to the approval of all. That's also false because Ibn Masood did not accept Uthman's recension of the Quran. He said that for the people of Uthman, they can use it, but the people in my community will follow my reading. Furthermore, I also documented that one of the memorizers, Ubay bin Kaab, called the master of Quranic reciters, had two extra surahs that he claimed was revealed from God. Ibn Abbas agreed. Where are those surahs? Finally, Ibn Masood, who claimed to have memorized over 70 surahs in the presence of the Prophet of Islam without error, claimed that chapter 1 of the Quran and chapter 113 and 114, although revealed, were not to be part of the text itself in recitation and only had 111 chapters. So if you're talking about memorization, far from it, they couldn't get it right from the beginning. Thank you, Sam. Uh, the question is for you. Does the Quran teach that Muhammad sinned and was bewitched? You got it? Yes. The Quran does teach that Muhammad sinned in such places as chapter 40 verse 55, chapter 48 verse 1 and 2, as well as chapter 47 verse 19. About him being bewitched, that's in Sahih Bukhari, volume 4, number 400. It says that Allah's messenger was bewitched. Now some Muslims will say that no, when the Quran is mentioning that Muhammad sinned, it's not really speaking of him, it's addressing his community. Surah 47 verse 19 will not allow for that. And yes, the authentic Islamic traditions affirm he did fall under the spell of a Jew and needed Gabriel to reveal Surah 113 and 114 to break him free from that spell. My question is this. If you look at the biblical prophets, not one of them ever fell under the inspiration or bewitchment of Satan. How is it that Muhammad, God's final messenger, did? Shall I respond? Yes. Yeah, two minutes. 
All right, now very quickly, the verses which uh, Sam is referring to actually speak about God commanding the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to seek forgiveness for his sins. And uh, Muslims agree that uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a human being, like the rest of us, do have sin. And he said himself, every child of Adam is a sinner, but the best of sinner is the he who repents after having committed sins. And he advises followers to seek forgiveness of God often, and he said that even I seek the forgiveness of God 70 times a day. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that he sins 70 times a day deliberately, but as a human being, uh, he re re realizes that we are fallible and we have to return to God for his forgiveness. And the promise of God is that he does forgive sins. And his promise in the Quran is that he has forgiven the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, for his sins, past and future. Uh, moreover, the question is, how could he be bewitched? Now, uh, uh, what about previous prophets? They were not bewitched, but previous prophets even claimed that they were deceived by God himself. For example, Jeremiah in the Bible says that the Lord Yahweh has deceived me and I was deceived. So if you want to make comparisons, we should be very clear what we're speaking about. Uh, often Sam is speaking about the Quran without knowledge about what he's speaking about. He asks, where are these other two surahs? I'll tell you where they are. Allahumma inna nasta'inuka wa nasta'gfiruka wa nu'minubika. This is what he calls a surah and he's saying that this is missing from from the Muslims. Muslims are still reciting that today, but Muslims generally agree that this is not part of the Quranic text. He says, what about Surah Fatiha and the last two surahs? Who has a problem with that? Did Ibn Masood said anything is wrong with that? He said, no, it is part of the revealed text, but we're not going to keep it in the Quran. This is Ibn Masood's misunderstanding, we would say, because the consensus of the Muslims is that these are part of the Quran. But do we have a problem with it? No. To include it or not to include it, no Muslim disbelieves in the content. But what about Mark, the last a chapter of Mark. Some people tore it off, suggested by the interpreter's one volume commentary, because they had a problem with it, and they put in its stead something else which Christians are reading today. <laughs> okay, question for Brother Shabir Ali. How can you refute the inerrancy of the Bible when the Bible was written over a period of 1400 years by 40 different authors, and yet no contradictions about a singular message of the Bible? Three minutes. Well, in fact, uh, the message of the Bible is contradictory, and uh, it is not a red herring to introduce the Trinity here, because the message of, the, of one part of the Bible is that Jesus is the Son of God, and from that he is promoted to Godhead, and then from that people say God is a Trinity. And that, in fact, goes away from the message of one God right from the very beginning in the Old Testament, and uh, in fact, right all the way to the end in the New Testament. Yes, the Bible does contradict itself in its main core teachings when the Old Testament taught that in order to be forgiven by God, you sacrifice animals, and, uh, and tells you that human sacrifice is forbidden, and then the New Testament tells you that God sacrificed His Son. God would have done the very thing which He said is wrong, and that's not right. Now, the Bible is also self-contradictory uh, in many uh, things when we come to fa matter of fact. For example, the Bible tells us about a certain pool in 1 Kings chapter um, 4 verse 26. It tells us about a pool uh, that uh, is me measures 10 uh, cubits in diameter and 30 cubits in, 30 cubits in circumference. And you know that's impossible. If it's 10 cubits in diameter, it has to be 10 times pi circumference. It will be 31.62 something. So, it does, in fact, contradict itself on matter of fact. Several verses of the Bible contradict several others on just simply the numbers that it gives you. For example, how old was Jehoiakim when he started to reign? Uh, how old uh, was this person and so on? So many different contradictions. But what is more important to notice is that over time the Gospels have contradicted each other in presenting Jesus Christ. So that over time the image of Jesus from Mark to John has changed. It, so that in John, Jesus is elevated. Even if you compare Mark with Matthew, you see how Matthew has changed the story. So that where Jesus referred to himself as Master in a certain place, he refers to himself as Lord in the same place in the New Gospel. Whereas somebody calls Jesus Rabbi in a certain place, in the same place in another Gospel, the person calls him Lord. You see that there is a development in the story. Where Jesus refers to God as God in the earlier Gospel, Jesus refers to God as Father in the later Gospel in the very same saying. And obviously, the story has changed. Where somebody, in fact, didn't believe in Jesus, they didn't know what to, to believe and their hearts were hardened, it says. In the same episode, you go to Matthew's Gospel and you see that the story has changed so that they worshipped Him. 
So that from one gospel to another there is a development in the story. Bruce Metzger, for example, has given many such examples to show if you compare Mark with Matthew and Luke, you see how Matthew and Luke, using Mark, have developed the story further along Christian lines, changing the image of Jesus so that Jesus appears more powerful, so that his weaknesses are hidden, and uh, so that Jesus, on whom be peace, appears more like the Christian depiction of him. My response? Here's your response to Pi. Read it. Secondly, when he talks about the development of the Gospels, again, if Shabir had actually read my articles, all these points have been refuted. Mark is not presenting a low view of Christ, nor is John giving us a high Christological view. In fact, I document from Mark that the Mark in Jesus is deity in flesh. The problem is, is that he quotes verses out of their intended context and forces a contradiction upon the Gospels and assumes that by making claims and not giving us any evidence but assertions, well, it was developed that he has proven his case. Furthermore, no two Gospel writers need to write the same thing about Jesus in order to be accurate descriptions of Christ. An author can emphasize a different aspect of Christ to the exclusion of the other because they want to bring out a different area of his ministry. And the whole point of Mark, even though there's many explicit references to the deity of Christ, is that Christ came to serve man. Not to be glorified as God because Christ's first mission was to die for sinners and rise in glory. Then he'd be exalted because of the path of self-humiliation he took. And about contradictions in the Bible. If Shabir wants to play that game, I can bring out, for every one contradiction, I'll bring out one in the Quran. Let me give you one. In chapter 41 verse 9 to 11 of the Quran, if you add up the days, it comes out to eight days of creation. Shabir's explanation is that the two first days and the four concurrent days where the Quran mentions the earth being created and then fashioned with all its nutrients are concurrent to give you six days. Now why is this a contradiction? Very simply, if you read other surahs, it says six days. The problem with Shabir's interpretation of the passage is that he neglects the authentic hadith and the interpretation of Muhammad which will not allow for his reconciliation. Muhammad actually believed that the heaven, the stars, the sun and moon was created after the earth. Time up. All right. Okay. Uh, this is uh, for Sam. <coughs> Sam, the Christians believe that Jesus, peace be upon him, died for three days. And then he was raised again. My question is, if Jesus is God, then who ran or operated the world when he was dead for three days. First of all, the questioner is committing what we call the fallacy of false dilemma. Christians do not believe Jesus is the only person who is God. The question assumes that if Jesus died, God died, but actually we believe in a triune God. That's first. So even if we were to say that Christ ceased to exist for three days, the Father and the Holy Spirit were still existing. Secondly, Christ did not experience death in the sense of the questioner statement. The questioner is assuming that death means non-existence. Christ never ceased to exist for those three days. What happened was his body went into the tomb, but his divine nature and human soul were still alive. How do we know this? John chapter 2 verse 19 down says, Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. How can someone who is in non-existence raise himself up? So he did not die in that sense. Okay. Notice that it is again in John's Gospel that Jesus says something so spectacular as destroy this temple and I will raise it back up again. Notice that in the earlier Gospels Jesus went to the cross submitting to the Father but hesitant and praying to the Father to save him. In Matthew, Mark, Luke. Why is it in John's Gospel he willingly offers himself? Now in Sam's own words he summarized for us the message of Mark and that shows you that the message of Mark is different than the message of the other Gospels. And the other Gospels have now magnify Jesus beyond the recognition of the pure historical Jesus. If you say that God didn't really die, well then stop saying that God died for the sins of the world. If you say that just the human body of Jesus died, then say that Jesus the human being died. Now while he says we're committing the fallacy of false dilemma, he is creating, committing the fallacy of equivocation. What, that is where you use an argument where a word refers to something and down below when somebody doesn't notice, the word refers to something else. 
So he starts off, the word Jesus refers to a God-man. But later on, the word Jesus refers only to a man. And then when you ask again, it refers to the God-man again. And one moment it refers to God, the next moment it refers to the, the Son of God, the next moment it refers to both of them, and the next moment it refers to the Trinity. You have to define your terms, what is Jesus? And then you have to ask, did he die or not? So what is Jesus? Is he God? Yes. Did he die? Yes. Did God die? They say no. <laughs> Okay, before we ask the next, next question, more index card would be distributed. You could just raise your hands, those who want to write oh, more I questions. Think, I don't think we'll be able to handle the ones that we have. So, okay. I think that my... Well, we, you, can, you can bring it here, uh, but please uh, mention uh, whom do you want to ask, because there are several here that they are for both the speakers, and we cannot entertain that. So, you please mention Sam or uh, Brother Shabir, very okay. clearly. Okay, now the question for Brother Shabir Ali. Explain whether salvation comes by following the commandments or by following the Paul's advice that is just believe that salvation comes by thinking that Jesus paid the bills. Uh, this of course is part of the, of the way in which the message of Jesus was distorted and changed over time so that the Bible uh, does not preserve the accurate historical memory of what Jesus taught but actually preserves what people like Paul have taught over time. Today, if you want to argue for this doctrine, you'll find the references to Romans, to Galatians, to 1 Corinthians, writings of Paul. You'll find very few writings or very few statements from Jesus to support the doctrine that Jesus came to die for the sins of the world in the earliest strata of, of data concerning Jesus. Notice that we're not saying that Mark is a Muslim gospel. We're agreeing that Mark says certain things which is very Christian. But notice the trend that we're talking about and this is the point that Sam actually misses. Sam has to show that there is no trend in development. Sam has to say that everything that John's gospel says, Mark says, and John's gospel does not place Jesus on a higher plane than Mark's gospel places him. But I bet you he can never prove that. It is in John's gospel, for example, that Jesus says, I lay down my life for my sheep. Whereas in the other three gospels, he went submissively, but praying to the Father to save him from that. Why is it that in John's Gospel he doesn't pray to be saved from the cross? No, it is true, he doesn't have to say the same thing in all of the Gospels, but why does he in John's Gospel says, and what should I say? Father save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason I came to this hour. You see the story has changed so that in John's Gospel Jesus deliberately came to die for the sins of the world. But if we take that doctrine that he deliberately came to die for the sins of the world, you have all kinds of problems. If Jesus died for my sins, then I'm automatically saved whether I believe in him or not. But you say, no, you have to believe in him. But why? If Jesus paid my debt, then the creditor can no longer claim my debt. If Jesus died as a ransom for me, then I'm automatically freed. And if if Jesus died as a ransom, to whom is the ransom paid? If to the Father, then he looks cruel. If to the devil, it, he looks powerful. So no solution really works. The best solution is to go back to the teachings of the Bible where you find out that in the Old Testament, people were forgiven for their sins. God said, do this and you will be forgiven. And the people did it. What do you think? They weren't forgiven? Now if they were already forgiven and now Jesus comes and dies for them, then the penalty is paid twice. And that would not be right. So no matter how you look at it, the doctrine that Jesus died for the sins of the world is very wrong. And the Quran comes now to reinstate the true teachings of Jesus, telling us that in fact we have personal responsibility. Surely you will err, you will be at fault, you will make mistakes, but when you make mistakes, God is ready to pick you up and to nurture you and to make you wholesome. Just ask God for forgiveness. If you wrong other people, repair the wrong that you have done for it to them. Ask God for forgiveness and God will forgive you. What does the story of the prodigal son teach you? That somebody dies for your sins? No. The prodigal son story teaches you from Luke chapter 15 that when you come back to the father, he welcomes you with open arms just like he welcomes, he welcomed that prodigal son who disobeyed him. So we should return to God, ask his forgiveness and be saved. My turn? Yep. Yeah. In response to Mark, I've written a response. Here you go. That's for you. Secondly, in response to the prodigal son, I guess Shabir didn't read carefully, because the prodigal son belonged to the family's house. So he was a son by birth and inheritance. But not everyone is the son of God, because Jesus himself said, some of you are the children of the devil. And if you want to know who Jesus died for, read the Gospels. And I'll give you Matthew, not John.
Because Matthew, in your words, is less developed than John. Matthew 1.21, it says, You shall name him Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Furthermore, you attacked Paul and giving the impression to the Christians and Muslims that this view that you hold to is a view that stems from Islam. That's the impression you give. You do not inform the audience that in Sirah Rasulullah, the life of Muhammad, page 653, quoting Muhammad, Ibn Ishaq says that Paul was a legitimate messenger of the teaching of Christ and a traveling companion of Peter. So the early Muslims disagree with you, not with me. Thank you, Sam. Uh, the question is for you. Why do you use Quran to prove that Bible is the word of Allah, quote-unquote, God? I thought I stated my purpose in quoting the Quran in the beginning. I do believe that the Quran is, ha has some historical value. It tells me what early Muslims believed. And I used it to show that Shabir's belief is not compatible with the earliest Muslim records. The earliest Muslim records, such as the Quran, for to me the Quran is not inspired truth, it's historical record of what Muslims believed. There we find that they assume the Bible is the uncorrupt word of God and then try to verify the message of the Quran by appealing to the Bible, but there's only one problem. Shabir accused me of assuming the Bible in my debate. No, the Quran assumes the Bible is the uncorrupt word of God. It is Shabir who assumes that the Quran is true, therefore if the Quran contradicts the Bible, then the Bible is wrong. It's the other way around, Shabir. The Quran affirms the Bible is the uncorrupt word of God, so any time the Quran contradicts the Bible, that means this cannot be from God, because God would know what's in the Bible, therefore a human author wrote it, and did not know what was in the contents of the Bible. So you've assumed what you have yet to prove. Alright, first, uh, before I answer, uh, Sam, I think you have to stop giving me these papers across the desk here, because the, the, very, the very purpose of having so many minutes allotted to us is that we should express our points here to the people. Not that we, you know, put it in the paper and pretend we have a nice argument there, but to, to bring it forward. And otherwise, we'll toss books back and forth. Now, <laughs> what does the Quran uh, assume concerning the Bible? I've already shown that, that whereas the Quran uh, does speak about the Bible containing truth, the Quran at the same time uh, shows that uh, certain things in the Bible is not true and is not from God. For example, the statement that uh, uh, people of old disbelieved who said that Jesus was the Son of God. And people who are following that are just simply following the statement of those who disbelieved. Who was the first person to claim publicly that Jesus was the Son of God? If we go by the New Testament in the book of Acts, you will see in chapter 9 verse 20 that Paul went into the synagogue and straight away he started to preach that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Was the, what was the preaching of the disciples before Paul? The original disciples of Jesus, according to Acts of the Apostles, went around from house to house and they didn't stop preaching that Jesus was the Christ. Notice that they preached that Jesus was the Christ, but Paul preached that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He moved the title Christ from its right place. And the Quran says, يُحَرِّفُونَ الْكَلِمَةَ أَمَّ وَعْدِعَ They change the words from their right places. Now from the Quranic perspective, Paul is not a true disciple of Jesus. He did not continue the teachings that Jesus left behind. And the teachings that he were claiming are teachings of disbelievers of old. Now, if some Muslim scholar got the information that Jesus had some disciples, one of them is Paul, and he wrote that in his book, that is not a proof that all Muslims are supposed to believe that. Muslims are supposed to be academic people. They study the Quran, they study writings of the ancient scholars, they see what they said, and they make their judgments concerning that. So, the Quran is the word of God that is unquestionable, but the wording of Muslim scholars are questionable. Sometimes they were right, and sometimes they were wrong. Thank you. Now, a question for Brother Shabir Ali. Show where Jesus says that he is not all-powerful and not God. Three minutes. Well, there are many passages in the Bible which actually show that Jesus on whom be peace was not the all-powerful God. In fact, uh, Luke, for example, tells us that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature. Uh, the book of Hebrews tells us that uh, Jesus learned obedience. So he was growing and learning. He was very much a human being. The Gospel according to Mark shows us that on one occasion Jesus coming up to a fig tree was hoping that he would find fruit on it because he was hungry. But Mark chapter 11 tells us that when Jesus came up he didn't find any fruit on it because it was not the season for figs. 
And so he cursed the tree, he said, may no one ever be, uh, eat fruit from you again, and the tree withered to its roots. Now, we can see here that Jesus does have some power, but he does not have the omniscience and the wisdom that goes with that power if we take this story to be true. I think there are some inherent problems with this story, but you notice that other writers try to modify this story by removing the offending phrase because it was not the season for figs. If it was not for that phrase, you can say that Jesus wanted to teach a lesson. This is not a good tree, so this is what you do with trees which are not good. You just destroy them. But notice, Mark by saying because it was not the season for figs makes it plain that it was a good tree. The only reason it had no fruit is because it was not the season for figs. But the later gospel writers removed the offending phrase. Moreover, uh, Mark's Gospel shows that on a certain occasion, Jesus didn't have the full wisdom and knowledge to know whom he healed. A woman touched him from behind and she was healed. It shows that Jesus was powerful enough to heal that woman even when he didn't know that he was healing the woman. But it also proves that he's not the all-knowing God. Because if he didn't know who was healed, it shows that someone else directed the power. The Gospel of Mark says that the, he felt the power going out of him. But he didn't know who was healed. He turned around and kept asking, Who touched me? Now, one might say, Well, Jesus became a man and therefore he became limited. But that is assuming first that he is God and then he became man. Why don't you assume what is obvious that he is a human being, he is a prophet, he is a messenger of God. And like messengers of God before him, he had the power to heal in the name of God or God was working through him. As Acts of the Apostles says in chap chapter 2 verse 22, that Jesus was a man approved of God by miracles and wonders which God did among you by him. It was God who did the miracles. Jesus, on whom be peace, was approached by a man and he was called good teacher. And he said, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. But again and again, Mark's gospel shows that Jesus, on whom be peace, had limitations. He was not the all-powerful God. And the later gospel writers tried to modify these stories in order to make Jesus appear more powerful. And you will see that Sam will modify the stories in his rebuttal to make Jesus look more powerful than the stories themselves show. But you read the text themselves, listen to the wordings of the Bible verses and then see how he interprets them and tell the difference. Okay. It's my About the fig trees, it's not Jesus who made the mistake, it's Shabir's ignorance of fig trees. Because before the season of figs, something small knobs appear on the tree called taksh. If they do not appear, that's a sign that this tree is barren. That's why Mark emphasized that. So you have to study the geography of Palestine. No problem with Jesus there. Secondly, about Jesus growing in human, uh, I'm sorry, wisdom and knowledge, that again shows that either you do not understand biblical doctrine or you are willfully misrepresenting what we believe. Because as Christians, we don't believe Jesus is but God. We believe He's God and man, and if you can't figure it out, that's again not a problem of the scripture. That's your finite rationality imposed on the scriptural truths. We don't have a problem with that. Acts 9. Why don't you read Acts 3, 14 and 15 and Peter gives us a high Christological confession. It says you killed the author of life. Showing that Peter not only believed in the deity of Christ but called him the source of life. You quote Hebrews and you alluded to the fact that Christ learned obedience. Why didn't you quote Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 to 12 where the author goes out of his way to prove that Christ is the creator and he's Yahweh God and read Hebrews in context to get your information what he meant not eeny meeny miny mo this first stage the rest have to go that doesn't work like that Amen. and the reason why I'm giving you my papers is I'm hoping you'll give me a freebie up there <laughs> thank you Sam <clears throat> the question is for you if you believe that God is fair how would he accept the injustice in the death of his son for the sins that he had not committed. Very simply, Christ came in perfect conformity and perfect will to the Father. He willfully laid his life down. Shabir mentioned Mark when Christ told the Father, if it be possible, let this cap pass from me, yet not my will be done, your will be done. Yes, he did say that, but also read Mark in context again. Since you want to stick with Mark, because in your opinion it has a low Christology, read Mark 10.45, where he says that he came not to serve, I'm sorry, not to be served, but to serve and to lay his life down as a ransom. 
So God did not unjustly punish Christ. The triune God in their perfect wisdom and knowledge sent the eternal word to become flesh who willfully died for the ones he loved. At the point in Mark's Gospel when you read the reason why Christ is asking that the cup be passed because now in His eternal existence He must experience something He never experienced before namely the wrath of God upon Him on our behalf. And that's why He emphasizes not my will Father, your will be done. And the Father answered no son this is what we must do for the saints and Christ willfully died. Read it in context. Mm, yes. Now, I think uh, first a, a word about my method. I think uh, Sam misunderstands my method. It doesn't mean that if something is found in the Gospel of Mark, I accept that or should accept that. And it doesn't mean that by taking some things and leaving some things, we're playing any, mini, miny, mo. It is now an accepted method in modern scholarship to try and reconstruct who was the historical Jesus. And we notice that in that, uh, in trying to reconstruct the historical Jesus, uh, we have to find out what Jesus was before later of tradition were put upon him before people claim things that were not true to him. Now as we study the four Gospels we realize that there's a trend of development from Mark to John over time. So what we have to deal with now is that trend and uh, Sam has to show that there is not that trend. I quoted several instances to show how that trend of development is there from Mark to John. And Sam has to show that no, that trend is not there. Now even in our present point, there is that trend. Although in Mark, Jesus submits and says, Yes, I'll do what you will, Father. But he says, Not my will, but your be done. Your will be done. But in the Gospel according to John, it is his own will. That is the difference. You see, in Mark, he's praying, Father, save me from this hour. But in John, he doesn't do that. In John, he says, no one can take my life away from me. Because uh, I've been given authority to lay down my life and to take it up again. Uh, th this is how he speaks in John. It is a different Jesus. Because in Mark, the story looks bad on God. If God says, well, you know, criminals, you have to die. But I want to save you because I love you. But somebody has to die. Who will die? Guards, bring my son. And then the son comes in and he says, Father, please, you know, let it not be this way. You're the greatest guy, Dad. Can't you think of something else? And the father says, no, son, you got to die. <laughs> Criminals, I love you. <laughs> so, in the Gospel according to John, the, the material is revised. So that Jesus himself comes in and says, Father, I will do it. Let these people go. I love them, Father. It is a new story. And that is the story that Christians would more likely remember. It is a development. A question for Brother Shabir Ali here. How does one attain eternal life before a perfect God? Well, Jesus on whom be peace apparently in the Gospels answered this question. A man came up to him and asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he said, if you want to enter eternal life, keep the commandments. So Muslims would agree with at least that statement, keep the commandments. In order to get eternal life and to be saved, one has to try one's best to keep the commandments of God. Now the Bible says be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. But I don't think we have to be perfect. I don't think we can be perfect. And I don't think it would be right for God to tell us that we have to be perfect before we are saved. Uh, because God knows we cannot be perfect. But God has made us fallible human beings. He has given us a law, a direction, a goal to reach. And has given us the instructions on how to reach that. It is up to us to try our level best to do that. Now some people will say, well, that means that you have no assurance of salvation. Man, you Christians themselves, despite some misunderstanding, do not have the assurance of salvation. Because in fact, the Gospel according to Matthew shows that on the Day of Judgment, some people will come up to Jesus demanding that salvation. He will say, I never knew you. There will be people who thought that they had the assurance of salvation. But I think one of the writings of Paul captured it right when he said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. There has to be some trepidation there, not a full assurance. Otherwise you overstep your limits and you go wrong. Now what happens after Jesus died for your sins? Christians say, well, we are saved. But notice the book of Hebrews says that if you sin after knowledge, there is no atonement for you. But Christians do sin, like the rest of us. Because the, the first John also says, if we say we have no sin, then truth is not in us. And we are lying. So if Christians do sin, 
and this is the result, then they have no assurance of salvation either. So the fact of the matter is that we do have an assurance of salvation, but to a limited extent. God has shown us, look, this is the plane, just get on the plane, do everything you can, and that plane is going to bring you to me. So people have to try and get there. When you buy your ticket, you have your visa and everything, you sit on the plane, if somebody asks you, are you getting there? Say, inshallah, I am getting there. If God wills, I am going there. But if I err, and I will err from time to time, I rely on the grace of God, to set me free. In fact, the story of Adam, as is told in the, in the glorious Quran, sets the record straight. The Quran tells him, not that you will die if you eat from the fruit, because we know he didn't die. The Quran tells him, if you eat from the tree, you will be a wrongdoer. And in fact, he was a wrongdoer. But then God gave him words of repentance to recite and to ask God for forgiveness. And God says, yes, he is tawab. He always uh, forgives the person who repents. So God forgave Adam. And uh, in fact, rather than speak about an original sin among Muslims, we talk about the original forgiveness. So human beings are not born condemned. They are not born in sin, but they acquire sins through their own volition. And for those acquired sins, one can always turn back to God, ask his forgiveness, and God will forgive him. First, I like the. Oh, it's my turn. I'm sorry. Okay. First, I like the comment on Hebrews six. Again, why don't you read the context to see what sin the author of Hebrews was specifying? The rejection of Jesus Christ, not sinning apart from that one major sin, which is unforgivable. So I appreciate, as you'd like me to quote the Quran in context, quote my scripture in context, please. Secondly. When you mention about original sin and Islam doesn't teach that, and again, I don't know who you're trying to convince, Shabir, because not only does the Quran allude to it, but the authentic Islamic traditions affirm that Adam's sin damned everyone else and cast them out of paradise. Let me quote to you Sahih Muslim, number 64, verse 10. I'm sorry, 64:10. Abu Huraira reported Allah's messenger, may peace be upon him, as saying, There was argument between Adam and Moses, and Adam came the better of Moses. Moses said to, said to him, you are the same Adam who misled people and caused them to get out of paradise. So according to Moses, it was Adam's slip that cast us out of paradise. How does Adam respond? Adam said, you are the same Moses whom Allah endowed with the knowledge of everything and selected him amongst the people as his messenger. He said yes. Adam then again said, even though you blame me for an affair which had been ordained for me before I was created. So you have the concept of original sin. The problem is you don't have divine forgiveness because you don't have a divine savior to save you from Adam's sin. Christianity has that. Okay, uh, thank you. Sam, the question is for you. How do you explain life and creation before Jesus on earth? Why did Jesus wait so long to come on earth? Why did God die? In all honesty, I don't know the mind of God, why He chooses to do what He wants. Why did He choose to send Christ at that time? God's sovereignty, His timing is perfect. I only accept what Scripture says. I assume the questioner is asking what happened to the people before Christ. Very simply. The Lord Jesus Himself in John 8, verse 56 to 58, John chapter 5, verse 45 to 46, and other passages affirm that the prophets died in the expectation of the Messiah to come. Those who died received the imputed righteousness of Christ because according to Revelation 13, 8, Christ was slain from the foundation of the world because in the foreknowledge of God all these things transpired and it was imputed to their account. Furthermore, going back to Shabir's original point where he says, do the commandments for eternal life. Shabir, read the rest of the passage, please. Because once the rich man responds, Jesus says, you still lack one thing to be perfect. Go sell all you have and give your riches to the poor. Then follow me. That's perfection, following the Messiah, and he will glorify you. Often when uh, Sam tells me to read this other passage and this other thing, again he misunderstands my method which I'm making quite clear. I do not have to accept every verse of the Bible. Yes, I can take some verses which seem to be a reconstruction of the original Jesus or a representation of the original Jesus. I've already said that it would be unreasonable for God to tell us that we have to be perfect like our Heavenly Father. 
And since it would be unreasonable for God to say it, by implication, I think it would be unreasonable for Jesus to say it, and I don't think that Jesus ever said that. So don't tell me to read that as though I'm hiding it. I'm making it plain to you. I do not accept everything in the Bible. Do you think some of the things that I asked Sam to read from the Bible tonight, I accept? No. So when, I, when we say to somebody, read it in context, we mean read it to show us that you accept the whole thing. And he's asking me that, and I'm keep, I keep saying, I am not that. Now, uh, the passage that he read from Sahih Muslim doesn't show that we have original sin. It shows that as a consequence of Adam eating from the fruit, humanity is not in paradise, but uh, we are here for a purpose, and after that purpose is fulfilled, we will, those who are successful, go back to paradise. We're in a testing ground, but we're not born in original sin. So it is a fallacy to say that Muslims believe in original sin because of this hadith which he quoted from Muslim. Notice now that the question itself cannot be answered, and this is a problem. It is not that Shabir doesn't understand. And often Sam says, well if you don't understand that Shabir, that's your problem. No, it's not that Shabir doesn't understand, it is that Sam doesn't understand, the Muslim world doesn't understand, the Christian world doesn't understand how God can be one in three and three in one, how Jesus can be God and Son at the same time, and why God had to come and die for the sins of the world. The question is, why at this time? It is at this time because the people who invented this idea thought they were living in the last age. Read Paul's writings. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 17, Paul thinks that Jesus will come come back anytime, scoop up Paul and the rest of the Christian believers with them, it will be the end of the world. They thought that Jesus came in the end of the age. <laughs> you got a fan over there. Okay, question for Brother Shabir Ali here. Sex with a number of women and wine is forbidden as a sin in this world. How could this, how could this be a reward in heaven? Uh, wine is forbidden in this world because of its possible negative effects. God tells us in the Quran that in wine there are some good things for humankind, there's some benefit, and also much evil. And the evil is greater than the benefit, therefore think about that. And then God prohibits it, so Muslims can understand that it's prohibited for good reason. The Quran doesn't deny that wine has some good benefits. Now what will happen in paradise is that wine will be given, لا يصدعون عنها ولا ينزفون From which they will have no headache and there will be no foul smell. There will be not in any evil effect. In this world, Satan uses wine to sow enmity between people and cause violence and wrongdoing. But in that uh, world of paradise, there will be no violence, no wrongdoing, no ill feeling, no hatred between any people. So that the evil effects of wine will not be there, and why not enjoy the good that God has created? If it is good, why not have it? Uh, in fact, uh, Jesus himself, according to the New Testament, has said that he won't drink of the fruit of the vine until he drinks it anew in the kingdom. So Christians should tell us what fruit of the vine he will drink. Some will say it is grape juice, but it is, it is plain that it is wine that is being spoken about there. In fact, the Bible says that wine cheers up Elohim and men. And perhaps Sam will tell us what is meant by Elohim, that wine cheers up. Um, moreover, why sex in, in heaven with a number of women? Is it prohibited here on the earth? Yes, if you do it all together at once. But if you have many wives, nobody has ever said it is prohibited on earth except that the Quran limited the number to four and says four only. But the Bible shows that Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines, 1,000. And so long as he went to them one after another, the Bible doesn't condemn that activity, does it? In fact, Solomon is shown to be a man who wrote scriptures for us. David and many other people had many wives. And the, uh, the Bible says that God found David to be a man after his own heart. Uh, and who does everything according to what God wishes. Acts chapter 13 verse 22. Uh, so then, if it is possible to have many wives and that will not be a sin, it is possible to have that in paradise and that will not be a sin. Okay. In response, I have no disagreement with wine, but about wine uh, cheers up the heart of Elohim. He doesn't tell you that this is Jotham in Judges, and he's speaking of a parable, and he's not speaking literally. Furthermore, as he himself correctly stated, Elohim doesn't say Yahweh. And Elohim can refer to the pagan gods, and in the context of Jotham's statement, the pagan deities were known for sex capades and getting drunk. Not Yahweh God. That's the context. Secondly, if you can have 70 specially created women in paradise, why not on earth? What's the difference? 
You say you can have four on earth and in paradise there's no problem. But there is a problem because the Lord Jesus who came down from heaven to tell us the secrets of heaven and who will come again in glory says no sex in heaven. That will not happen because instead of sex we will enjoy the perfect holiness and peace and beauty of God. We don't need carnal pleasures. Okay, we settled the issue. It's a personal problem. Can't share it with you. The Quran states that Ju Judas died on the cross, not Jesus. It also says in the context that Allah made it seem so. Is Allah deceptive? That's with me? Yes. First of all, in all fairness to the Quran, as I ask of Shabir to be fair to my text, not believe it, but quote it in context, nowhere in the Quran does it say Judas. So in fairness to the Quran, that does not exist. And furthermore, in response to deception, that's kind of funny. Because earlier, Shabir quotes Jeremiah saying that Yahweh deceived me. That's Jeremiah 20. Read the context. The Hebrew word is pathath. The word means also persuade. And the context is speaking of Jeremiah's refusal to preach the word. Yet God persisted and persuaded. And because God is greater than Jeremiah, he had no choice but to give in. About deception, that's a difficulty in Islamic scholarship and I care not to comment because I do believe God is sovereign and can choose to use methods that to us seem to be unacceptable. But it is not an attack on His Holiness. So I have no problem with that Quranic statement and in all fairness the Quran does not say Judas was killed. Now uh, Sam, I think you will agree that there is a great deal of difference between uh, deceived me and persuaded me. And if there is so much difference between these two words, why does the Bible say deceived me instead of persuaded me? I mean you can argue for a subtlety of meaning, but this is going really too far. Uh, the Bible does say that God deceived me and I was deceived. Uh, moreover, the Bible says that uh, if, if a prophet tells a lie, it is God who sent a lying uh, tongue into that prophet. And moreover, uh, the, some of the writings to the Thessalonians said that God will send strong delusion so that the people will believe a lie. Uh, so it, it is a bit, I think, escaping the point to try and say that the Bible doesn't teach that God deceives people. However, uh, more to the question, the Quran doesn't say that God deceived uh, the, the people. What, God, what the Quran says is that the people were trying to crucify Jesus, but instead of that, the God rescued Jesus, raised him to himself, and made it seem so that they were crucifying Jesus. The Quran doesn't go into the detail of how this actually occurred. But uh, some of the ancient writings point to Judas Iscariot as a man who was crucified instead of Jesus. He fell into the same trap that he tried to place his master into. Notice that the New Testament is not uh, clear on what happened to Judas Iscariot. Matthew's Gospel and Acts of the Apostles gives two de depictions of what happened to Judas Iscariot. One might want to say that it is reconcilable, but you have to go to great lengths to try and reconcile these two statements. Matthew's Gospel says that he took the price of the evil that he had done, he went and bought the potter's, uh, or he threw it into the temple treasury, and the priest bought the potter's field, and so it was called field of blood, because obviously the blood money. But the Acts of the Apostles says that he himself bought a field with the money, when he went into there, he fell headlong, and he burst open. And that's why it is called field of blood, because obviously he's got some blood spilled out into the field. So you have two different narratives here, who bought the field, and uh, why is it called field of of blood, two different answers. One can say, all right, he went up on a cliff, fell down, and you know, after hanging himself, and he spilled his guts. But uh, that's besides the point. The fact is that you have a contradiction here. <laughs> okay. oh, yes. Uh, I have a response. Was that a question to you? No, that was a oh, question to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, because of the time limit, we will have just two more questions now. Inshallah. Question for Brother Shabir Ali. Is the Quran translatable? Or the Quran translatable? 
Um, it, it is possible to make a, a translation of the Quran into another language which would re reflect uh, an author's understanding of the Quranic text and his attempt to try and convey that understanding to his readers. Now I've said that in a long way, but that's what all translation is about. Whether you're translating the Quran or the Bible or any other text, a Quran by a, a translation by definition is an interpretation. That's what you have in any translation. With the Quran, the interpretation is a little bit more difficult because you're dealing with a very terse language in the Quran to try to express that in English sometimes we'll have to express a number of subtleties of the Arabic language which is not always possible from one language to another and is sometimes more difficult from the Arabic language to other languages moreover when you're translating the Word of God the translation will never be like the original whether you're dealing with the Bible or the Quran or some other book however in the history of Islam it became quite well known that Muslim scholars resisted translating the Quran and it is often thought that this means that people are not uh, going to get access to the Quran, whereas actually the opposite. Muslim scholars feared that if you read translations, that will distance you from the actual words of God in the original language. And so they recommended for people, instead of reading a translation, to learn the original text and read and memorize and understand that. On the other hand, in the biblical world too, translations were resisted. William Tyndale, who made the first English translation of the Bible, was actually put to death for his translating work. Why? Because the Catholic Church thought that people should not read the Bible. If they read the Bible, they would lose their faith. Whereas on the other hand, uh, Muslims believe that if people read the Quran, they would find their faith. And they wanted people to read the original text. Even today, although we are re relying heavily on English translations and other language translations, we still publish the Quran side by side, the original text, with its English translations. You will notice that hardly Christians walk around with Greek texts uh, side by side with the English. A few scholars may have it, but very, people, very few people know how to read it, and very few people would understand that. But uh, most Muslims try to read at least the Arabic text, even if they do not understand the words. And uh, much more, when uh, studies of the Quran is being done, it is always uh, done based on the Arabic language. Uh, notice my words. You see, if you listen carefully to what I say, you wouldn't hold up a Greek text for me. I know you have Greek texts. I have three Greek texts in my own personal collection. And I know you can publish them side by side as well. I also have one with the same si sort of arrangement. But mostly Christians don't walk around with that. How many Christians have in their, position, in their possession a Greek text of the Bible? No, at, at all. How many Christians? All right. At all? Yeah, how many Muslims have in the possession a, a, an Arabic text of the Holy Quran? Yeah, you see? It's, uh, uh, no, but it proves... What it proves is that Muslims, and this is indisputable, I don't think it's a debatable point, it is indisputable that Muslims have paid more attention to the original Arabic text of the scripture than Christians in general have paid to the original language text of their scripture. Thank you. Okay, Sam, this is the last question for you. If, let me say, brother. I'm sorry, brother. If Jesus died so that Christians will be free of sins, so what is the reward for those who do good things versus those who do bad things since all Christians will go to paradise? The answer to that question is not all Christians who profess to be Christians are truly of God. Shabir alluded to that. He also alluded to Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 where it says work out your salvation. But if he quotes verse 13, it says for it is God that works in you and through you for his purpose. Meaning that if God has truly begun a work in you, he will complete and perfect it, which is also in Philippians 1.6. Since we still have a corrupt flesh nature that we struggle with, those things that we do in the flesh we will be rebuked for. Those things that God in His sovereignty works through us, He rewards us not because He is obligated to do so, because He loves to do so, because we are His family. And I can call God my Father, Shabir cannot, because of Jesus Christ. That's the difference there. Shall I respond? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, this father business. Uh, it's not that Shabir cannot, but Shabir will not. Anyone can commit blasphemy. But to say that God is your father, what are you saying? Is that you have such a special relationship with God on whose authority? You see, on the Bible, what we've been showing tonight, that the Bible is uh, not entirely the word of God. In fact, the very idea of calling God father is something that is part of the developing trend. If you see how many times Jesus refers to God as father in Mark's gospel, and how many times 
times he refers to God in, as Father in John's Gospel, you'll see a remarkable difference. In Mark it's something like four, three times rather, and in John it's something like 118 times. It is quite a remarkable difference and it shows that over time the story about Jesus was being reshaped and refashioned. For example, and on one occasion when the mother and brother and sister of Jesus came to look for Jesus, Jesus said, uh, whoever does the will of God is my mother and brother. the will of my Father in Heaven. You see, God has been changed to Father in Heaven. It is part of the development and what Sam has not shown is that this development is not there. He has not proved that. So I think that's to, that holds that there has been that development. Calling God Father is a deviation from the original message. How many shall happen? But no, something was misinterpreted, misunderstood. Abba Father, maybe it comes from Paul, but not from Jesus. Remember, all the Gospels were written after the writings of Paul, and so they betray some influence from the teachings that Paul had already left behind. All the New Testament scholars worthy of note today will tell you that Paul's writings are the earliest writings of the New Testament. Thank you very much. Really thank our distinguished speakers here, Brother Shabir Ali and Brother Sam Shabul for giving us a very good performance. <laughs> On behalf of the Muslim Students Association who organized this program, I would like to thank all of you for coming here. I would like to thank the organizers for having a very well organized program, starting on time and finishing on time. I would like to thank our God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for giving us this opportunity so we could present both sides and it's up to the audience yes. to choose the truth. We have both the booths up there, the literature for both the Christians and the Muslims. So it's up to us, inshallah, to go and recognize the truth. And I would now invite uh, a representative from the MSA uh, of University of Iowa. I just have a few brief announcements to make. Uh, first of all, Isha prayer will be held at the mosque at 10.30. And also, just to reiterate what's on the back of the program, um, there'll be a lecture on Saturday, the Bible Quran Science, featuring Shabir Ali, 3 p.m. in the Illinois room of the uh, Iowa Memorial Union. Also, a book exhibition from 1 to 5, also in the Iowa Memorial Union in the Iowa and Penn State room. Also, um, the public access uh, series, Get to Know Islam, the uh, debate will be broadcast on that. Uh, the date to be determined, but stay tuned on that. Um, as he said, there's materials in the back for both uh, Brother Shabir and Sam Shamud in the rear. Um, once again, just on behalf of the Muslim Students Association, we'd like to thank you for coming. The intent of this debate was not necessarily to divide into teams and just exchange blows and see who's uh, standing at the end. We just wanted to uh, give like a, an objective presentation of both sides and once again let you decide for yourself. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. If you have any questions, comments, or anything, go to this website. This is our website, www.uiowa.edu. Uh, Muslim students, it's up there. Any questions, concerns, or anything? Good debate. Good debate. Thank you very much. Thank you.